very welcome to all of you. Uh, you have to excuse my English. I'm, I'm a real Afrikaner and a real puck. In, in my five years here, I have learned to sp speak a good Afrikaner English. But w welcome, welcome to tonight's debate, and I hope you enjoy it a lot. Uh, if you have any questions, you can post it on Facebook, on Rashi Christie's Facebook page, or you can tweet it on Rashi Christie's Twitter page. Um, okay, and then, we're going to just Prof. Flip on the word style. He is our moderator for the end, and he's going to rest of the things on the end. Thank you, Aunt Mona. From my side also, a hearty welcome to everybody, specifically to our um, two speakers tonight. You will see that they are extremely competent and sharp people. You will have to be wide awake that you can really keep up with them. Let me first say a word of hearty welcome to Yusuf Ismail. He's an attorney from Durban. And more specifically, he's an Islamic scholar, a public speaker, and a debater on religion and contemporary society. Having debated many prominent apologists and philosophers, he has debated arguably the best Christian philosopher of the century, William Lane, William Lane Craig, Mike Lycona, J. Smith, John Gilchrist, and many others on a variety and a range of topics and issues covering the relevancy of religion in the 21st century, the authenticity of scriptures, and the issue of peace and violence in world religions. I had the privilege to, this is the second time I have to moderate a debate where he is a speaker. I can assure you He's got a very sharp mind, and when I listened to him the first time, I thought, wow, I wish the students, the theology students, would know such a lot of theological resources, but also know how to answer the questions that are raised by these theologians he is quoting. Let's give a hand to, Dr., uh, to um, Mr. Yusuf Ismail. Then we are greatly privileged to have Dr. James White with us. He's the director of the Alpha and Omega Ministries. That is a presuppositional apologetics organization based in Phoenix, Arizona. He received his BA from Grand Canyon College, his master's from Fuller Theological Seminary, and then he also received a THM, a THD, and a DMIN degree from Columbia Evangelical Seminary. He has served as a professor of Greek, of Hebrew, of systematic theology, and various apologetics topics at the Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary Extension Campus in Arizona and the Columbia Evangelical Seminary. He is also a critical consultant for the Lockman Foundation, and he has written over 24 books. Dr. White has participated in over 130 public moderated debates covering topics such as Calvinism, Roman Catholicism, Islam, Mormonism, the King James Only Movement, Jehovah's Witnesses, and atheism. His debate opponents have included scholars such as Bart Ehrman, John Dominic Crossan and Marcus Borg, and popular, popular, popular risers such as Dan, Dan Barker and John Selby Spong. Dr. White has also been an elder of the Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church in Phoenix, Arizona, since 1998. He's married to Kelly. And they have two children, a son called Joshua and a daughter called Summer. He's got one grandchild. Now, 
what we will be doing tonight is Dr. White will be the first speaker on the question, is the New, New Testament a reliable record of Jesus' teachings? And he will have 30 minutes. And then after him, Yusuf Ismail will also have 30 minutes. Then I will give them each 10 minutes for rebuttals. And then Yusuf Ismail will speak first of all on the Quran. Is the Quran reliable? Is it a reliable record of Muhammad's teachings? He will then again have 30 minutes. Dr. James White will have 30 minutes to respond on that. And then there will be 10 minutes, 10 minutes rebuttals again. And then if we can fit it in, we will have a few minutes for Q&A, questions and answers. But I will give them each five minutes for concluding remarks. The goal of this discussion is to learn what are Muslim viewpoints of the Christians' understanding of the Bible and vice versa, what are Christians' viewpoints of the Quran. How reliable are these documents? The speakers will not be abrasive. They will respect each other. And if not, I will stop them. And we plead with the audience to be the same. Dr. White, you are first. All right. It is an honor to be with you here this evening. We'll be discussing some things that uh, the Muslims in the audience have probably never heard of before and the Christians in the audience have probably never heard of before. And so I, I hope you will give equal attention to both sides, no matter what side you might favor right now. I hope you will, if you're on my side, I hope you will listen very carefully to what Yusuf Ismail has to say and vice versa as well. I hope you'll listen to what I have to say, even if you come here this evening uh, as, a, uh, as a Muslim. Now, real issue. I really want us to understand what the real issue tonight is. Few today understand the history of ancient documents. Most people sitting here probably think that the Bible you have in your hands or the Quran you have in your hands uh, just arrived in the form that it was. The Bible's always had a leather cover, it's always had gold pages, and it's always had a thumb index. That's actually not the case. The process of transmission in antiquity is vastly different than it, was, it is today. Today we can just hit print and out comes uh, something from our computer. That is a very, very modern thing, I assure you. Hand copying was the only way to produce documents for distribution until relatively recent times. Every document produced prior to printing, and actually even after printing, has been corrupted, quote unquote, in its transmission. Now I need to define the term corruption. Corruption is any variation or alteration in the text, no matter how minor it might be. Some of you have heard about uh, the Adulterer's Bible. It was one of the early uh, printings, the King James Version. And as they, they set the type for the Ten Commandments, they forgot the word not, and thou shalt not commit adultery. And uh, many hundreds of copies were printed before someone noticed the problem, so it became known as the Adulterer's Bible. So even in the invention of printing, you still have corruption of the text due to the fact that, well, we human beings, we do some rather intriguing and interesting things. Now, there are over 5,700 cataloged Greek manuscripts of the New Testament comprising ancient papyri containing only a few lines of text all the way to complete manuscripts from as late as the 15th or even 16th centuries because uh, some people thought that just like the iPad, printing really wasn't going to catch on. Well, they were wrong as well. And so people continued to do hand copying even well after the invention of printing because printing presses were just not all that prevalent for a lengthy period of time. Now, including ancient translations such as those into Latin or Coptic or Sahidic or other languages such as that, more than 24,000 manuscripts of the New Testament are known. Now, I'm speaking only the New Testament this evening. Uh, we would not even have time in 30 minutes to even begin touching the subject of the Old Testament. We're looking primarily at the New Testament uh, this evening. Now, no ancient work comes even close to the New Testament with reference to the number of witnesses and the number of early witnesses. Now, I'm not including the Quran when I speak of ancient works. The, the Quran is not a work of antiquity. It's a work of the medieval period. 
and so it's not really in the comparison at this particular point in time, though I will probably later on make some comparisons between the two that I think are extremely uh, educational. Now here is a, a graphic that gives you an idea. Uh, on the graphic you will see uh, a center point and then radiating out from the center point are various uh, yellow circles. Uh, for example, the largest uh, yellow circle on this side, right here, uh, represents the works of Homer. Uh, the size of the circle indicates how many manuscripts we have. And the distance from the center tells us how much time has elapsed between when a work was written and the first manuscripts we have of that particular work. And so in this case, Homer is the largest with 643 manuscripts, and there's about 500 years between when Homer was written and the first manuscripts we have of that particular work. Uh, the next one is Sophocles, out toward the, the uh, outside a little bit. We have 193 uh, manuscripts, but there's 1,400 years between when it was originally written and the first manuscript copies we have. Now, the big yellow sun on the left is not the sun at all. That's the New Testament. Uh, that is the number of manuscripts we have, including translations into other languages, of the New Testament. And you'll notice it gets very, very close uh, to the original source. That is because it is by far the earliest attested of any work of antiquity in our possession today. Uh, that means we have manuscripts of at least portions of the New Testament that date to within, uh, the, the, well, some would argue we have a couple scraps that go into the first century, uh, and we have a number that go into the second century as well making it very early attested. And of course, the sheer number of these manuscripts really presents one of the problems for scholars who work in this area because we have so much information. Uh, in comparison to someone, if someone here is a, do we have any scholars of Sophocles here? Uh, you all would probably love to have the problems that we have in regards to the number of manuscripts we have of the New Testament. That is an interesting, I think, comparison. Now, I want you to think with me about something. The more witnesses that one has, the more manuscripts that one has, the more variants one will have. If you only have one witness, how many textual variants can you have? None, because there's nothing else to compare it to. Once you have two manuscripts, then there's going to be a difference between the two. Once you have ten, then you're going to have the differences between the ten, etc., etc. So if you only have one witness, you'll have no textual variants, but you likewise will have little basis upon which to believe you have the original text. You'd have to trust. If you only had one version, you only had one example, you'd have to trust that whoever produced that one got it exactly right. Most of us can intuitively recognize it would be far better to have 10 copies than to have one copy. But what does that introduce? It introduces textual variation between them, and we have to compare them one to another. The more witnesses you have, the confidence you have that you possess the original text increases. It increases, and that's a very important thing to remember this evening. Now, taking the most liberal estimate, we have about 400,000 variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. That sounds like a huge number until you start thinking about it. About 99% of those variations cannot be translated out of Greek. That is, they do not impact the meaning of the text. For example, uh, there is, if you've ever taught Greek or learned Greek, there's something called a movable new. And uh, I remember a, a fellow that took Greek with me, and uh, he just could not get the concept of the movable new. Uh, it was like saying an apple versus a apple. You're supposed to say an apple. Some of us skip over that. But Greek had the same kind of concept in it. And many of the scribes didn't understand it either. Now, you, you can't, it has no meaning, it has no impact upon the meaning of the text whatsoever, but a lot of scribes made an error, and as long as one scribe made an error, that's one of those 400,000 variants that we talk about in the manuscript tradition. Of the remaining variants, the vast majority are simple errors of sight or hearing, depending on how the manuscript was produced. That is, was it a person copying another manuscript, or a person in a scriptorium who is listening as a manuscript is being read to them and taking it down via dictation. Now, very, uh, one of the very particularly common errors that we find in the manuscript tradition is homoiteluton, which means similar endings. How many times, you students, you have been working on a, you've been diligently working, because your professors are here, diligently working on a term paper and uh, trying to get it done early, and you're, you're checking your sources, and, and you're copying from uh, a source, and you're, you're typing it into your computer, and you type the word uh, education, 
and it ends with T-I-O-N. Now, T-I-O-N is a common ending in our language. And so you type T-I-O-N, and your eyes go back to the book that you're copying, and you see T-I-O-N, and you continue. Um, the problem is the T-I-O-N you saw was the word location on the next line. And so you've continued on from there. Now, the problem is you have now inadvertently deleted an entire line of text, and you didn't even realize it because of similar endings, I-N-G, E-S, T-I-O-N. Those types of endings are the ones that catch us. And the same thing happened uh, to the scribes of the New Testament. On the screen in front of you, you need to realize that for the first 800, 900 years of the history of the text of the New Testament, it was written in what's called majuscule text. Uh, all capitals, no spaces between words, and almost no punctuation. It's simply a long line of capital letters. And so you're copying that long line of capital letters, and you come across this line right here, and uh, it actually says, Hina tekna theu kleithomen kai esmen diatuta. But you get to the end of the word kleithomen, and I've used, uh, uh, that's interesting it's using that font, but I've used the uh, red right here, you can barely see it here, but there's kleithomen, and then here's Kai Esmen right here. And your eye, you write Clay Thoman, your eye goes back, sees the new M-E-N, and you continue on from there. You've now accidentally deleted the phrase Kai Esmen. This is the exact textual variant you'll find in 1 John 3.1. In 1 John 3.1, in the ESV, NASB, uh, NIV, etc., etc., it will say that we might be called the children of God, and such we are. But the King James doesn't have the phrase, and such we are. Is it because the King James translators didn't like adoption as, as sons of God? No. It's because the manuscripts they were dealing with, which is a very small number of manuscripts in comparison to the number that we have today, did not contain this reading, and it's a simple error of homoiteluton. Thankfully, we don't have just one manuscript of 1 John. We have many manuscripts of 1 John, and they come from different times and different places. And because we have these many manuscripts, and because we understand the nature of the type of errors that scribes would make, we can identify this kind of error very, very clearly. This is the vast majority of the errors that we see in, uh, in the New Testament. These kinds of scribal errors are common and expected in any widely transmitted document. As long as anyone has a robust manuscript tradition representing various geographical areas and containing early witnesses, these kinds of variations are rather easily detected. But all of these considerations, here folks, if, if, you're, if you're starting to drift, tune in. All of these considerations relate primarily to a freely transmitted text, not to a controlled, edited, or redacted text. This is the key issue this evening. We need to understand the difference between those two kinds of texts. And let me make sure that you see this. A freely transmitted text is one whose transmission is not controlled by an external authority such as a government. It is widely copied without constraint. A controlled text is one that is copied under the guidance of an external authority. Everything I've said to you about comparing manuscripts, everything like that, that only applies to a freely transmitted text where copies were able to be made by different people in different places and there was no one standing over them going, no, you need to change this to that, or no one who had the ability to alter the transmission of that text over time in a purposeful direction. The New Testament is a freely transmitted text, uh, and as we'll see later on, that is the contrast this evening. A freely transmitted text will have more textual variants, but will have greater confidence as to originality. A controlled text will have more uniformity, but much less confidence as to originality. Now, this is the thesis of the debate. Uh, if Mr. Ismail is going to interact with my position this evening, this is the point that he is going to have to deal with. And that is, my assertion is, a freely transmitted text will have more textual variants. You know, if the government uh, isn't in control, if the government uh, isn't saying, well, we're going to produce one version and we're going to distribute it, and uh, if you don't have our version, we're going to take your version and destroy it. The result over time is that that one government-approved version is going to have a pretty clean transmission over time. But the problem is it has a much less level of confidence as to originality. Why? Because once you have an external authority that comes in and says, this is going to be the text, what do you have to believe? That they got it right the first time. And especially if they destroy the materials that existed before it, 
you can only take your confidence back to that point of the redaction, of the editing. And you have to trust they got it right at that point because you can't go any earlier than that. And that is the fundamental difference in the transmission of the text of the New Testament versus that of the Quran this evening, as we will illustrate over and over again in various ways. A freely transmitted text can promise to present the original readings in its manuscript tradition. A controlled text cannot promise the original text past the last redaction or revision, especially if previous versions are destroyed. So in other words, even amongst all of those textual variants in the New Testament, I have absolute confidence that one of the readings found in the manuscripts is the original. We still have all the original readings. We may have to study them to find out which one's which, but we have the original readings. But if you have a controlled text, you can't make that claim. All you can say is, well, we know what it read at this point in history anyways, but before that, we don't know. We can't tell because there is a redaction, there is an editing, there's a controlling of the text. That is the fundamental difference that we're looking at. So how did we get the New Testament? Well, by the way, um, I made this graphic, so any oohs and ahs would be appreciated. Um, because, it, oh man, everyone's so nice, thank you. Um, we, we need to recognize the New Testament was written by multiple authors at multiple times, in multiple places, to multiple audiences. And that means you might have Paul writing in Thessalonica, he might be in Rome, uh, you might have John in Ephesus, you have people, you have the same author writing from different places and writing to different churches at different times. And so these manuscripts go all over the world. And uh, let's say Paul writes to the, uh, uh, the, the church at Colossae, and uh, someone comes through and they say, you know, we, we haven't seen that letter, could we copy it for our church? And so a copy is made, and that letter then goes to another church and to another church. And this is how the letters are copied over time and present and move all around uh, the, the known world. Eventually what happens is that you have these copies coming together and collections start being made. So for example, uh, I recently, uh, just a couple years ago, had the wonderful opportunity of seeing uh, manuscript P46 uh, at uh, the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin. And uh, that is the, uh, 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 one of the earliest manuscripts that, that we have from the New Testament. Uh, there's manuscripts of Paul, there's manuscripts of the Gospels. You have, you have manuscripts like P75 of the Gospels and things like that. These are collections that take place over time. And then eventually you have entire New Testaments coming together. But my point is this, there was never ever a time when there was ever a controlling authority that could control the entire text of the New Testament. And so when people come along and say, well, uh, you know, all these doctrines were inserted, so on and so forth, there was never a time when that could happen. It is vitally important to realize the transmission of the text of the New Testament did not follow a single line of transmission. The New Testament originated in multiple places, written by multiple authors, with books being sent to multiple locations. You would somehow have to be able to control all those multiple lines to be able to make purposeful changes in the text of the New Testament, and there was never a time when that could happen. This means the text was never under the control of a single individual or group. At no time in its history, at the time of authorship or at any point during its time of transmission were the New Testament documents under the control of an individual or under the control of a group. As a result, we can look forward, in fact, to finding even earlier manuscripts of the New Testament documents as the free transmission of the text has provided us with a solid basis for asserting that we continue to possess the original readings of the authors themselves. And I want, to, I want to reiterate that point so you hear what I'm saying. Because of the nature of how the New Testament was transmitted, it demonstrates something called tenacity. Tenacity. The transmission of the New Testament textual tradition is characterized by an extremely impressive degree of tenacity. Once a reading occurs, it will persist with obstinacy. What does that mean? Well, that means even silly readings are still found in the textual tradition. For example, there is one rather humorous manuscript. Uh, evidently, you know, some of you recognize what it's like to, you, your alarm didn't go off at the right time, you go rushing into class early in the morning, you're not an early morning person anyways, uh, your coffee tastes bad, and uh, it's just very difficult for you to do a really good job that morning. Well, there were scribes who had days like that. And there was this one scribe, he, he must have gotten up on the wrong side of the bed one morning, and, and uh, so he is copying a manuscript that has two columns of text. And you're supposed to read down this column and then read down this column. But he wasn't really paying attention that morning. And so he just copied straight across. 
And um, unfortunately, this was in the genealogies of Jesus. Um, and so in that manuscript, God has a daddy named Ferris. I don't know, you know, it's, how did you not catch that? You know, I mean, you really got to not be paying attention to what you're doing. But you know what? We still have that manuscript. And it's a good thing we do. And you go, why, why is it a good thing that we would have a manuscript that has a silly error like that? Because the New Testament manuscript tradition is tenacious. Once a reading appears, it stays there. You say, well, that, how is that a good thing? Think about it, my friends. That means the originals stay there, too. The originals stay there, too. And that's my confidence in practicing New Testament textual criticism, is that I can be looking at an extremely complex variant. And, and Mr. Ismail, I'm sure, is going to talk about a number of extremely complex variants. But I can look at it, and today we have more information than any generation has ever had before us. On this iPad, I have more textual information than any generation before me had in one place in any library in the world. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. But I can look at that information, and I can have absolute confidence that one of those readings is the original. I'm not just tilting at windmills. I'm not just uh, engaging in some kind of academic exercise here. The original reading is still there, and I need to determine which one it is. And that is an artifact of the way that God has preserved the New Testament text by having it explode across the known world. Now remember, during the first 300 years of its existence, up until 313, and the peace of the church, what was going on? Christians are being persecuted. Uh, a papyrus found recently that documents the Romans going into a church in Egypt and destroying 300 manuscripts in that single church. In that single church. And there were, there were many Christians who lost their lives for even possessing the Christian scriptures. And so the Christians realized we need to be, we need to be proliferating this text because there are people who are destroying it. And so there was a lot of copying going on, but not everybody had their copyist card. Not everyone, you know, you know if, 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 you, if you say you really can't have uh, a, a proper transmission of the text until you can do it perfectly, you know when God would have had to have waited to give us a, a revelation of himself? 1949, that's when they invented the photocopier. Well, obviously God didn't want to wait that long. And God felt it was quite appropriate to give us his word in a way that would have to be transmitted over time in this fashion. And uh, that he has done. And he has done so in such a way that we can have confidence. In fact, someone, uh, a friend of mine used a very good illustration. He said, what we have in the New Testament is like, like having a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. Now, what would be worse? To have 10,100 pieces or 9,999? Any of you ever done a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle and then discovered the cat ate the last piece? It's a bad thing. It really makes you mad. It's a whole lot better to have to figure out what the 100 extra are than it is to be missing 100 or 1,000 or something else like that. And the reality is in the New Testament what we have is like a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. We've got 10,100 pieces and what textual critical scholars do is they find out what those 100 extra pieces are. But the originals are all still there. That's vitally important uh, to understand. Now let me quote. Um, there we go. It is precisely the, oh, this is a quote, it is precisely the overwhelming mass of the New Testament textual tradition, assuming the Huguenus Nusa disascalia of New Testament textual criticism, which provides an assurance of certainty in establishing the original text. We can be certain that among the New Testament manuscripts, there is still a group of witnesses which preserves the original form of the text, despite the pervasive authority of ecclesiastical tradition and the prestige of the later text. That, of course, is from the rather well-known work by uh, Kurt and Barbara Alon, the text of the New Testament, pages 291 through 292. The Alons, of course, have run the New Testament Institute in Munster. Uh, Kurt, of course, has died, but uh, for, for many, many, many years. So here is someone who knows all of the textual variants and says, we can have great certainty that the original is still there. He believes in that, uh, that integrity of the text. Now, what we hear very often from people, we hear words like, there are more variant readings in the New Testament than there are words. Because there's 400,000 variants, there's only 138,162 words in the Nessian 27th edition of the Greek New Testament. So that means there's three variants per word. No, that's not what it means at all. But you will hear statements like that. Uh, we do not have two similar manuscripts in the New Testament in their contents. If what you mean by that is a photocopy of each other, that's obviously the case of every work of antiquity. That's nothing new. It is impossible to know today what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Paul might have written. These kinds of statements are very, very common 
in our day in the, what I will very honestly identify as radical skepticism. These statements represent skepticism beyond that even of unbelieving scholars like Bart Ehrman, who recognize that such statements go far beyond what the actual data could possibly substantiate. The picture of the New Testament presented here is never presented by anyone who has done first-hand study of the New Testament documents. Never. Let me give you an example. A number of years ago, I asked my computer uh, to compare the two most dissimilar printed texts of the New Testament. In other words, for those of you who know the field, to compare the Westcott and Hort text with the uh, majority text, the Robinson Pierpont uh, majority text. So in other words, the Byzantine versus Alexandrian manuscripts. Here in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 8 through 20, uh, you'll see on the screen that I have marked in green, if you can see it, right there. There's one right there, one right there. Uh, don't worry, doctor, I'm not going to hit you with a laser. Um, and uh, there's, I think, one, no, there's only three, only three places where these printed editions, which represent the widest variations in the manuscript tradition, vary from one another, and they are not major issues. There is no question on the part of any scholar that we know what these verses said originally. This is what was written. There can be no question about that. It, it would require absolute radical skepticism to come to any other conclusion than that. So what you have from radical skepticism is they'll, they'll give you graphics like this, where the blue line represents the number of words in the New Testament and the red line represents the number of variants. But then if you know something about the New Testament, then you know some of the facts about that. You know, for example, what they don't tell you is that 99% of all those variants do not impact the meaning of the text. Uh, you also discover that 1% of 400,000 equals about 4,000 meaningful textual variants out of 138,162 words is 2.9% or one meaningful variant every three pages. But only half of these are viable. In other words, if you, if you run across a manuscript written, oh, I don't know, uh, 1,400 years after the original, and it has one mistake in it that no one else has ever made, that's not, that's not found anywhere else in the world, that doesn't have a chance of being the original. And so it's not a viable reading. So only about half of these are viable. So there's about 1,500 to 2,000 viable meaning New Testament textual variants. That's a very, very different picture. And I forgot to, I'm sorry? Yes. Uh, that's a different picture. And let me show you what that picture would look like. Now the blue line is the number of words and the red line is the number of variants. Very different picture than what is normally presented uh, when people attack the text of the New Testament uh, today. So. 1,500 to 2,000 meaningful and viable variants, over 2 million pages of hand-copied text spanning approximately 1,500 years prior to the invention of printing, is an amazingly small percentage of the text re reflecting an amazingly accurate history of transmission. One might say it is downright miraculous. Now, the real issue again, free transmission versus controlled transmission. One is superior to the other. Having a controlled transmission of the New Testament text or any work of antiquity diminishes the confidence that you can have that you possess the original. Because once someone has control of the text and can manipulate the text, then you have to have utter confidence that one particular person or group got it right. You see, with a free transmission of the text, I don't have to trust in any one particular person because the, the source, the streams, come from so many different places and we can compare them with one another. So free transmission of the text versus controlled transmission, key issue this evening. I honestly think if you want to evaluate how this evening goes, ask yourself the question, did both sides address that issue? Multifocality, the fact that the New Testament writers, you have multiple writers, writing at multiple times to multiple audiences, vitally important issue, and then the tenacity of the text, the fact that the writings, the original readings, they still exist, they are still there. And so when Mr. Ismail raises various textual variants, please realize those of us who work in this field know all about them. Some of us, believe it or not, we don't have a lot in the way of life. But some of you got, saw how excited I got when when uh, the moderator mentioned my granddaughter, Clementine. She's the joy of my life, she really is, and she is the cutest baby that's ever been born, and that is without question, okay? So, uh, and you're supposed to say that, and, but she actually happens to be, I wish I had a picture I could put up so I could prove it, but um, some of us don't have a life though, because to be honest with you, you know one of the things that I read regularly? 
uh, I have a, a rather thick book. It's nothing but all the textual variants in the New Testament. And uh, every once in a while, I just sit down, I just read through a few pages, expose myself to some more, look at, look at these types of things. And some of us actually find that to be very interesting. Some of us do that so you don't have to. But the reality is, any variation that uh, Mr. Ismail is going to present, we've seen before. And you know why? Because Christians are wide open with their text. You can go to the bookstore right now. I bet you can buy a Nessie Allen text. You can buy a United Bible Society's text. All this information is going to be right there. It's on the internet. It's all over the place. But you cannot today buy a critical edition of the Quran because one doesn't exist. Now they're working on it, but one doesn't exist. That's the difference. You see, we can look at this information, we put it all out there and we say, this is how God has preserved his text. Yes, we have textual variants, but those textual variants are the result of the very means that God used to preserve his text. He had to go out all over everywhere. Everyone, every Christian said, we want everybody to know the gospel. You want to copy this? Great, make a copy. And as a result, there are textual variants. But as a result, I can stand before you this evening and say, because of the tenacity of the text, we have all the original readings. God has preserved his word, even during those periods of persecution and into this time of unbelief. God has preserved his word for us. Thank you very much. And now, also half an hour to you. Mr. Yusuf, Ismail. Auz billahi min ash-shaitan rajim I seek protection in God from Satan, the accursed one. Bismillah rahman rahim In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Khoyanan, good evening, and welcome to all of you. The discussion for tonight, as James has correctly articulated, is the New Testament a reliable record of the teachings of Jesus? When you look at the New Testament in general, it's a well-known fact that in Christianity, depending upon the church, Bibles can be divided into either the Protestant church, the Roman Catholic church, they have got their own canon. Amongst Roman Catholics, you've got 73 books which they believe to be the inspired word of God. The the Protestants, you've got 66. The Anglican Church has its own canon. The Greek Orthodox Church has its own canon. Coptic Church, the Ethiopic Church, the Syriac Church. So if you look at their books, their New Testament that they would have would not be similar to what those in the Protestant world has. If you look at the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, they basically say that it is safe to say that there is not one sentence in the New Testament in which the manuscript tradition is wholly uniform. And we're going to unpack that shortly because James has alluded to a few issues on that particular point. Look at a conservative scholar like Bruce Metzger. He says that from early Jewish writings, the Bible consisted of Old Testament and some Jewish apocryphal literature. Furthermore, there was as yet no conception of the duty of the exact quotation from the books that were not yet fully in the full sense canonical. Therefore, it is exceedingly difficult to ascertain which New Testament books were known to early Christian writers. Our evidence does not become clear until the end of the second century. Meaning, prior to the second century, people never had a uniform idea in terms of what constitutes a New Testament. What are the books in terms of the New Testament? So the books of the New Testament as we have it today has its origins as inspired scripture from the end of the second century. If you basically look at the Gospels in general, who wrote the Gospels? There is a general consensus among scholars that the Gospels have been written anonymously and none of the writers claim to be eyewitnesses. If you open the Gospels in general, you start with the Gospel according to Matthew or the Gospel according to Mark, the Gospel according to Luke, the Gospel according to John. If James White has to author a book, I will not write there um, the forgotten trinity according to James White because it is in fact the book that's written to him. Yet the word according to is incorporated at the beginning of the particular gospel because of the fact that there is a suggestion that no one knew the authors of this. Matthew's gospel, for example, written in the third person. Why would he want to do that? Why would some writings be anonymous, pseudonymous? Matthew 9.9, 9, 
Acts chapter 4 verse 13 tells us that the disciples were unlettered. They spoke Aramaic. Yet you find that the Gospels as they exist today in certain instances are written in sophisticated Greek, like the Gospel of Luke. If you look at the origins of the Gospel, according to many scholars, some would tell us that Matthew and liberal scholars would tell you it was written about 100, John about 110, Luke in the year 75, Mark between 60 to 65. The problem is that it is possible that the writers of the Gospels who have the name attributed to them were possibly dead at the time of the compilation. And those dates are only in theory because the manuscripts date far later. Now I'll give you an example here. We've got two people. One is Richard Borkham, the other is the late F.F. Bruce. They're both conservative scholars. They believe the Bible is the Word of God. They believe in the divinity of Christ. Borkham particularly wrote a book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. And they went on to discuss the relationship between the Synoptic Gospels, coming to the idea that when we compare the Gospels, we can see how the stories of Jesus were changed to reflect a higher view of Jesus. You have parallels. Matthew has a story, Mark repeats the same story, Luke has the same story, and John has the same story. And when you do a reading, and when you cross-reference these particular Gospels, you find certain significant changes. For example, on the occasion when Jesus was transfigured, the transfiguration, in Mark, Peter calls Jesus Rabbi, Mark 9.5. But in Matthew, same incident, Peter calls him Lord. So can you see Matthew, which was written far later to a different audience, as James has conceded, changes the wording to reflect a higher Christology of Christ. If you look at further, Matthew made Jesus describe himself as Lord. In Mark 13, 35, Jesus tells the disciples to wait and watch for the imminent return, and he called himself the master of the house. But in Matthew 24, 42, same incident, he describes himself as your Lord. So can you see the change? But more particularly, can you see what's happening? There's an evolution. At a place called Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asks Peter, who do you say I am? In Mark, Peter says, you are the Messiah. But in Matthew, he says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So Matthew improves the account by making Jesus or developing a higher Christology of Jesus. Matthew reduces Jesus' emphasis on one God in Mark 12, 29. The commandment is, Shema Israelu Adonai Lahainu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But in Matthew, same occasion, the individual comes and asks Jesus, what is the first commandment? He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. Can you see there is a reduction in the emphasis of the divinity of Christ? or an, increase in the, uh, in, in, uh, uh, an increasing in the focus of the divinity of Christ. Matthew made people pray to Jesus. You remember the incident when Jesus was asleep in the boat, a storm rocked the boat. In Mark, what did the disciples tell him? They said, teacher, can't you see? We are drowning. Don't you care that we are drowning? But in Matthew, same God, same story, same incident, same account. They say, Lord, save us. We are perishing. So can you see Matthew improves the account in contrast to what you have in Mark. It's not just a contradiction. It's an improvement, a stylistic improvement in terms of how the author wanted Jesus to be reflected to the particular community that he was writing. Matthew reduced the distinction between Jesus and God. Mark 10, 18. Someone says, good master, what good thing shall I do to enter eternal life? Jesus says, why do you call me good? There is only one good, and that is God. But in Matthew, he says, why do you ask about what is good? There is only one who is good. So can you see he reduces the distinction between Jesus and God. And you could basically go on. I'm not going to belabor on this point. There are hundreds of examples. When we read a book, you read it from beginning to end. We need to start reading the same account in a parallel fashion as they occur in different Gospels. And you'd see there are striking changes. I mean, Mark shows that the night before the crucifixion, Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying that his soul is troubled. And he says, let this cup pass away from me. But in, Matthew, in John's Gospel, the last, Jesus does not pray. He says, it is for this very reason that I'm going to be sent. And he declares at the outset that he's not going to basically pray. What about the incident covering the limitations of Jesus, the story of the fig tree? 
Mark 11 verse 12 to 14, Jesus was hungry. He sees it in a distance a fig tree having leaf. When he comes to it, he finds no figs because the season was not there. So Jesus says, may no one ever eat fruit from you ever again. Matthew, same incident, same story. Jesus was hungry. He goes, he finds nothing but leaves. And then Jesus says, may no, no fruit ever come again from you. And the tree withered. But Matthew does not mention that it was a season for figs. Now James in response to this will say, well look, Matthew's depiction of the event uses the narrative as a parable to show how those who refuse to bear fruit will be dealt with. But the point is that in Mark's gospel, the first gospel, according to Mark and priority, the indication is given that Jesus was ignorant of the figs. He had human limitations. Matthew changes it and the ignorance of the season is basically eliminated. So can you see basically that when you move from one gospel to the next, we can see how Matthew reworks the particular tradition. The difference is further pronounced if you go into the gospel of John. I am the light of the world. I am this, before Abraham was I am. In the beginning was the word and the word was of God and the word was God. All those are basically only in the Gospel of John. Why is it that they're not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke? I'll be quite fascinating also, and I, just to be naughty, maybe a little later on in the debate we can emphasize or deal with the issue of John 1.1, 1, 1, whether even that, as a Greek scholar, and him knowing Greek is in fact an indication of the divinity of Christ, but we'll see how far we can go in the particular debate. So, as it stands now, that's the evolution in the particular gospel accounts. Many scholars have basically pointed out in the particular book I have here that without a knowledge of the history of the text, the original reading of the text cannot be established, particularly when you have an ignorance of the history, the date, the composition, the circulation. What apologists generally ignore, and James dealt with, you know, I don't want to focus on some of the issues he raised, but maybe later on in the rebuttal we'll deal with that. But what apologists generally ignore is that there are no traces of the most important church doctrines such as the original sin and the trinity. We have only two papyri dating back to the second century. Many of the divergences about Jesus evolved at a particular point in time at the time of the emergence of the particular gospels. And that becomes a problem particularly when you look at the failure of textual criticism. According to Eberhard Nestle, whom he quoted in the introduction to textual criticism of the New Testament, he says that the problem of finding the autographs is possible when we understand that the greater portion of the New Testament, via via the epistles, are occasional writings never intended for publication or meant to have a limited circulation. I'll be quite fascinated to find out, for example, um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 17. Here the biblical scholar Daniel Wallace alludes to the fact that in this particular verse Paul alludes to every letter that he had written to churches. Now if you take into account, if you assume that he had only uh, uh, written to Galatians and uh, only Galatians and 1 Thessalonians are prior to 2 Thessalonians. So if Paul speaks about writing every letter to the churches and if you assume the South Galatians theory, then where are all these letters? Why is it that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 9, concerning I think the, um, I can't recall the actual issue, but he says that concerning the fornicators, if I'm not mistaken, I write this, but in a previous letter, he makes mention of a previous letter that he wrote to the Corinthians. And where is that letter, if this is in fact the first letter to the Corinthians? So that becomes a major, major problem. So, in conclusion, on that point we can say that we have no version in the world that claims that it is copied from the original autograph. We have no version that is identical to any modern critical text of the New Testament. The versions of the New Testament are witnesses to four divergent text types. It's like all of you doing a summary of what happened here today. And then your friends copy what you write and then their friends copy what they write, and then their friends copy what they write. And then hundreds of, for hundreds of years later, you find a whole series of articles about what happened here. Can you verify the authenticity? And that's basically what you need to do with the New Testament, is that scholars have to pick and choose to see what possibly could be the original. The versions of the New Testament are not identical. James agrees with this.
There are different readings, even in the versions. None of the original manuscripts of the version is extant. Therefore, existing scholars have to engage in what they would call textual criticism. No language has the exact feature of Koine Greek. The Thai Tesseron of Tatian, which is a gospel harmony, where you take all the gospels together, is considered the earliest translation, but again, the version is not helpful because no copy has survived. The original language is unknown, and the gospel harmony, uh, it's a gospel harmony. It's like a combination of all of them, and it eliminates contradiction. So what do you do in those circumstances? Well, you're left with this. One has thousands of manuscripts, and one needs to therefore reconstruct what possibly could be the ancestor of these ancient texts. So we do not have any originals. We have thousands of texts, but they are many years later, and that becomes a particular problem. Kurt and Barbara Allen, and he quoted them. They are authoritative. This is what they say. He says, they say, until the beginning of the 4th century, the texts of the New Testament developed freely. Even for later scribes, parallel passages of the Gospels were so familiar that they would adapt the text of one Gospel to that of another. They also felt themselves free to make corrections in the text, improving it by their own standard of correctness, whether grammatically, stylistically, as I showed, or more substantively. Why would you want to make stylistic improvements to the Word of God? Do you know more than God himself? So you want to now choose that you can edit and change and adapt and amend and make the improvements accordingly. And what they importantly say further is that in contrast to the Hebrew Old Testament and other Oriental traditions such as the Quran, where an almost letter-perfect transcription was the rule. Almost letter-perfect transcription was a particular rule. And so you've got basically developments in terms of how they proceed and how they um, um, develop the particular text. Sometimes you find that the selection amounts to no more than an eclectic guess. So what does James White and myself agree to tonight? And we need to know whether the rest of you agree. Number one, he agrees to that we don't have any originals of the books of the New Testament. We don't possess the original sayings of Jesus nor in his language. You see, even if we had the original manuscripts today, and in an email discussion I said, I'm prepared to concede that you've got the original. Let's deal with the original. Let's assume that this is the original. And he didn't want to debate on that particular issue. But I'm saying, let's even assume we've got the original. You wouldn't have the original sayings of Jesus. Why not? Because Jesus spoke Aramaic. He never spoke Greek. Majority of these copies date to the 8th century. And of course, there are many mistakes but those particular mistakes, um, some of them are significant, some of them obviously are not um, too significant. This is a critical example. This is the language Jesus spoke. He spoke Aramaic. There are more mistakes in the New Testament than words, as James correctly pointed out. Some mistakes matter, some don't, and the task of the author is to basically show what the original, and this is what they do. So if you look at this here, if you look at the Gospels, this is basically the different manuscript text types. Can you see that? The total number of manuscripts. And what happens is that on the top you've got the Greek New Testament, the different editions. Can you see that there? And then you've got the different sorts of papyri. And then you've got the percentage used out of the 5,000 somewhat manuscripts. Now the question is why so little? Why so little? Why do the scholars use such a little percentage to come up with these Greek editions which you can buy from, a, from a, a bookstore? Why is that the case? It's because the vast majority do not agree with each other. This is a committee of Bible scholars, and what they're basically doing is that they're constructing the New Testament. You've got uh, Bruce Metzger, the late Bruce Metzger, Kurt Erlen, and so on. And what they're doing is at the back you see certain annotations. And the annotations are an indication. The letter A indicates that the text is certain. The letter B indicates the text is almost certain. Letter C indicates that the committee had difficulty in deciding which variant to place in the text. And the letter D indicates that the committee had a difficulty in arriving at the decision. So these are categorizations that they place to particular texts. And they then say, well, look, this is probably authentic. This is not. This is not authentic. This we have a difficulty, so they vote. And that's how they basically construct the New Testament. And unfortunately, um, for the vast majority of people, most people don't seem to understand how these particular writings work. 
Of the 5,847 Greek manuscripts, no two are identical. The earliest we have is the Uspensky Gospels dating to the 8th century. That's Theodore Beza. And basically he constructed the first New Testament. Um, what, what he did was he used corrupted text to compile the New Testament. Several readings have been found which have never been found in the particular manuscripts. James White, in his article examining Muslim apologetics, says that scribes were extremely conservative in the handling of the text and were fearful of losing anything in the copy or copies that they were working for. Scribes were hesitant to change or correct what was found in the text. I don't know, James, whether you still accept that. You do believe in that. Well, that's basically something that he accepts. He's basically indicating that there's no indication to suggest that the scribes made any deliberate changes or deliberate alterations. Okay. Um, here's one example here. If you look, for example, at Matthew 8.15, he touched her hand and the fever left her and she arose and ministered unto them. Now, after noticing parallel passages, Mark 1.31 and Luke 4.39, the scribes changed auto, him, to autois, them. Matthew changed Mark's version. Why did he do that? Because he thought that the woman was supposed to serve only the one who had cured her miraculously, but later scribes considered Matthew's choice incompatible with the claim that the canonical Gospels are, in fact, not the non-contradictory Word of God. If you can go on further, beloved or chosen... In Luke 9.35, there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Now, the earlier manuscripts, P45, P75, have the word, is that, ek leglegmenos, chosen one. And what the later scribes did is that they changed it to agapetos, beloved, to harmonize it with Mark chapter 9, verse 7. Now, James said, well, there were no deliberate alterations, but here you can see, ek leglegmenos has been changed to agapetos. And Philip Comfort, a biblical scholar, says, as often happened, divine proclamations of Jesus were harmonized. Mark 6, verse 22. Mark chapter 6, verse 22. What happened in Mark 6, 22? Here the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod with them and then said, and the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatever thou wilt, and I will give it unto thee. Earliest manuscripts, Mark chapter 6, verse 22, Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus, tell us that the girl who danced and pleased Herod is Herodias who is Herod's daughter, Otto Herodiados. But in Matthew 14, 6, we are informed that the girl who danced was Herodias' daughter. So the scribes did change Mark 6, 22 to Otto's Tes Herodiados, the daughter herself of Herodias, to fit the parallel passage that you find in Matthew 14, 6. Yet, basically, Josephus tells us that Herod's daughter from her first marriage was Salome, the wife of Philip the Tetrarch. This would mean that the daughter's name had become confused with the name of the mother. Galilee or Judea, Luke 4.44, and he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. What then subsequently happened? Scribes changed the earliest manuscripts, which read the synagogues of Judea, to the synagogues of Galilee. Because the context of verse 44 informs us that Jesus was in Galilee before and stayed there. So the UBS follows the earlier manuscripts. But the King James Version, the Afrikaans Bible, which I've got here in my hotel this um, evening, what does it have? It has Galilee. So why is it that millions and millions of people like the Afrikaners, the Zulus, the Songas, the Kozas, the Swanas are not being told about what is happening? It's only in the critical editions that you basically become aware of this. Look at these corruptions here. A defiled God, when the days of her purification were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem. The oldest and majority of the manuscripts have Autorn, there. Later manuscripts change it to Ortes, her. Because if you say, and when the days of their purification were accomplished, it would mean that Jesus himself was impure. So the scribes saw this problem, and they say, well, we can't say Jesus is impure, so they had to change it to Autorn, there. And many of the critical Greek editions follow the improved account in terms of what they have. Matthew 5.22, But I say unto you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Without a cause is not to be found in the original manuscripts. The scribes added without a cause because they knew that whoever is angry shall be in danger of judgment, but Jesus himself becomes angry. So can you see what they do? They basically had to add without a cause. So that was a deliberate change. 
James says there were no deliberate change on the part of scribes. Nervous Jesus. Jesus moved with compassion. The word is Augustus. Actually should be anger, not with compassion. Submitting yourself to the fear of God. It is the scribes who changed the fear of Christ to the fear of Theo. And so on. And one could go on and on and on and on. Uh, I've got a library of collections on terms of this. We just simply don't have time. James, in his discussion, made discussions and mentions of all these minor issues that are affecting us about, um, I think, something about Fares being the father of God or something. These are minor issues. How many of us here believe in the ascension of Jesus? Pick up your hands. Everybody. Well, everybody believes in the ascension. Yet there are only two Gospels, two accounts in the Gospel which make reference to the ascension. Mark 16, verse 9 to 20. Luke 24, verse 51. Of course, you find that mentioned in Acts, but in the Gospels, only these two places. Why did James not tell you that these two, verse, these two passages are fabrication? Why didn't he tell you that? How many of you believe that's a fabrication? James believed that's a fabrication. What about Jesus and the adulteress? How many of you believe in the story of Jesus and the adulteress? Everybody. It's in my Afrikaans Bible. It's in the Zulu Bible. It's in the Arabic Bible. Everybody believes in it. You see it in Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. You see it in Jesus of Nazareth. But do you know that James and I both are aware that the vast majority of biblical scholars would tell you that that's a fabrication? There was never such an incident. The earliest manuscripts never had that. So why is it that people now are believing something that has never been there? And it's not the fault of you. It's the fault of the scholars and the apologists who failed to inform their congregation. I mean, in the discussion he had, he could have mentioned you all these particular points. He didn't decide to mention that. I mean, the Trinity, the first epistle of John chapter 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. How many of you believe in that? Everybody believes in it. Yet that is also a fabrication. It's not in the original ancient, and James agrees with me as well. So why didn't he tell you this? Obviously now, the fact that the found, and that's the point, it's the doctrine that's a problem here. That's a foundation. We don't have such problems with the Quran. You might have in the ancient manuscripts, grammatical mistakes, rearrangement of surahs and so on. No problem on doctrine. Here is a foundation. You can easily quote, go baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as you find at the end of Matthew's Gospel. But the problem there too is that baptism in the early church was never done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It was done in the name of Jesus. So can you see the difficulty? Can you see the problem? And we've got hundreds and hundreds of such critical issues. If you open a cursory in the Revised Standard Version, it will tell you at the footnote, other ancient versions add, other ancient versions omit, and other ancient versions insert. Meaning that it is a guess. And when it affects issues such as dogma, then it becomes increasingly problematic. Very much so. Even on issues like, for example, the death of Jesus. If someone has to die for our sins, the most important person in the world, we should know when he died. If you look at Mark's dating of the crucifixion, for example, you would tell us, and I know time is coming to a close, Mark tells us in Mark 15:25 that Jesus is crucified that same day at 9 o'clock in the morning on the day of Passover, the morning after the Passover meal was written, was eaten. But in John's gospel, on the other hand, Jesus doesn't have the meal with the disciples. He goes somewhere else. They do eat a final supper. He's betrayed. And then in John 19, 14, it was a day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Noon? On the day of the preparation for the Passover, the day the lambs were slaughtered? In Mark's gospel, Jesus lived through that day. So why is it that John makes a stylistic change? John makes it is that in John's gospel, Jesus is a sacrificial lamb. And John has to change a historical datum in order to make a theological point. Jesus is a sacrificial lamb. To convey that theological point, John has to create a discrepancy between his account and the accounts of the others. So can you see the problems that we have in New Testament textual criticism? It's not too simple to say, yes, there are obviously insignificant variations, as James has highlighted a few, but there are certain significant variations. The ascension is intrinsic to Christianity. The Trinity is intrinsic to Christianity.
When did Jesus die is intrinsic to Christianity. What the problem in Christianity today is that to get to what scholars think is perhaps the original text, they have to engage in a process of reconstruction. And what they do, they look at the divergent manuscripts, most date from the 8th or 9th century, a few from before that time, and based on the different manuscripts, they then construct what they call a critical edition. And these editions go on to its continuous evolution. And that is a problem that we have. And I'll leave you at that. Thank you very much. Dr. White will now have 10 minutes for rebuttal. If I had the time, there is not a single reference that Yusuf Ismail just presented that I could not demonstrate to you the original reading of the New Testament. Not a one. Not a one. It is amazing that Yusuf said, why didn't he tell you about that? When I sent Yusuf books that were written 19 years ago that I authored that discusses every single reference in depth. Every single reference. The longer ending of Mark, the Percipe Adultery, John 7, 3 through 8, 11, 1 John 5, 7, etc., etc. We have discussed these things. We've presented these things. You can go on my YouTube page. You can see entire videos about each one of these things. They are not unknown to us in any way, shape, or form. And folks, what you need to understand is the only reason Yusuf Ismail could talk about any of these is because we know what the original is. Did you catch that? He says, see, scribes change this. How does he know that? First of all, because we publish all of our information. He can't do it with the Quran because he doesn't have, for example, all the palimpsest readings from Sa'ana Sa Sa or the Fog's palimpsest. He can't do that with the Quran, even though it has the same type of history. So you can only do it with the New Testament because we're very open in providing this information. But the only way you can say scribes did this is because we know what the original reading was. We know what the earlier manuscripts actually said. And so to say, well, you know, why not talk about these things? We have. In fact, I predicted the exact approach. There was nothing that was just said that even begins to address the thesis that I gave you, that the free transmission of the text is superior to any kind of controlled edition, uh, transmission of the text. Nothing whatsoever. Hopefully in the rebuttal, we'll have some uh, uh, address of that. Uh, for example, I, I mean, honestly, there are so many examples here I would love to get into. He said there were, there were no traces of the Trinity in the papyri. I have examined papyri P72. I have read the Granville Sharp construction, 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, which refers to Jesus Christ, our God and Savior, long before the manuscripts he was talking about. Uh, he talked about 2 Thessalonians 3.17, and Paul identifies his own handwriting. He says, we don't have the other letters of Paul. Why are we supposed to? God knew exactly what to include in the canon, exactly what to preserve. Just because Paul may have written other letters to people doesn't mean those were inspired scripture, do they? Examine the assumptions of what is being said. He said, we don't have any manuscript identical to the original. Of course, no two manuscripts of the Quran are identical either. There's in any work of antiquity that is handwritten and passed down over time. The only way you can get an identical manuscript is if you carve it in stone. They're not very portable, but they would be the same anyways. Okay, that's, that's, that's the case of any work of antiquity. It's a given, it's a non-argument, it's a non-starter to anyone who actually knows the New Testament. Um, uh, he, he presented the single line idea of transmission, error after error after error, which has already been refuted. That's not how the New Testament came about. There is no evidence of this. Did you notice that in almost all of the, uh, very few, in very few of the presentations, did Yusuf actually give us the textual information so we could examine it for ourselves? He's using sources that give him that information. He, he mentioned Philip Comfort, for example. Uh, that gives you all the, all the manuscripts. But he didn't give it to us. So, for example, uh, he, he raised Luke 2.22. If you actually look at Luke 2.22, which I discuss extensively in my book on uh, the King James Only controversy, you'll discover that it's only very late manuscripts. In fact, some critical editions don't even address it because there's no possibility that the change that was made there, which was because of the later rise of the Marian dogmas, uh, that that had anything whatsoever to do with the original reading whatsoever. We can see all of those things. Now, it was, it was, uh, we also had, uh, for example, uh, the date of Jesus' death. What day did he die? Now, I realize there are lots of scholars today uh, that want to say that John gives a different date than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He doesn't. The very word for Friday in the Greek language is preparation day. And if you just realize, and this is something I've addressed many, many times, this is not something we're hiding from. It was just said that apologists don't talk about these things. I've been doing it for, for almost 30 years. We do talk about these things. The very word for Friday, the name is preparation day. John tells us, as long as you remember, that the Passover was not one day. It was a week-long celebration. John is in perfect harmony with Mark and Luke. 
Why is it so many scholars don't go that direction? Because basically to get published today, you can't go that direction. You have to come up with something new. The idea that, well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the same, uh, you know, going the same direction doesn't really get you anywhere in publication. So John actually does give the exact same time. Um, we, we heard, for example, uh, the quote from uh, the Alans in regards to the free transmission of the text. Funny, we were talking with, uh, with scholars this morning about this very, very issue. Unfortunately, he hasn't read the later material from uh, Barbara Alon that uh, uh, very clearly identifies the fact that amongst the papyri, the largest portion of the early papyri are strict texts, not free texts, and that means they're strict in providing exact copy of their exemplar, and unfortunately, that free statement is frequently taken out of context and misused by those who don't actually work in the field itself. So again, even the, the table that was put up in front of you and said, they're only using 10% and things like that. I'm sorry, Mr. Ismail just doesn't understand what that table's about. That table is either about the main text reading representing a certain percentage of the original manuscripts over against the later manuscripts, um, or the number of manuscripts that are cited in a particular critical text, but it's not what he said. It's because there's so much difference between the manuscripts. That just isn't the reason why those percentages are the way they are in that particular text at all. Now, there were all sorts of other issues that were raised. He raised all sorts of issues about the canon. We can talk about the canon of the New Testament. Uh, by the way, uh, the differences exist in the Old Testament canon. Not, there's no difference between Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Protestants on the New Testament canon in any way. There really isn't any question about that. What other books would even be suggested? And the interesting thing is, from an Islamic perspective, uh, the Quran talks about the Torah and the Injil. We know what the Injil was in the days of Muhammad, and it's exactly what we have today. And according to the Quran, it contains light and guidance. So we may want to discuss that in the second half uh, to see if there has been a consistency uh, relating to that. I, I don't know why uh, Yusuf keeps doing this, but he keeps going to Mark 13:35. And in all the discussion of the Synoptic Gospels, did you notice that somehow Yusuf Ismail knows what Matthew, Mark, and Luke were thinking? He also seems to know what every scribe was thinking. This scribe was afraid of this, and so he made this change, and, and Mark wanted to make this change, and he, he was, he, how do you know that? Isn't it, uh, isn't it, isn't it much more uh, simple to say that they're following the sources that they had rather than trying to climb into their minds 2,000 years later and say, oh, they were, uh, they, they're just slavishly copying Mark and didn't like what Mark had to say. As N.T. Wright has said, we don't know what order the Gospels were written in. You can theorize that Mark's the first. You can theorize one source, two source, three source, four source. You can throw Q in. You can throw proto-Mark in. You can throw all sorts of stuff. It's all theories. Nothing more than theories. You never found any manuscripts to substantiate these things. It's all theoretical. And on the basis of that, you can mind read somebody and say, that's why they made the change? I want to handle my sources a little bit more carefully than that kind of presentation. So, for example, uh, Shabir Ali, Yusuf Ismail, they all go to Mark 13, 35, and they say, see, uh, in, uh, in Mark 13, Jesus is called the master of the house, but in Matthew, he's called Lord. The problem is they're basing that on an English translation. The actual Greek of Mark 13, 35 is how kurios tastes oikios. It's the word kurios. So Mark uses a longer title than Matthew does, but he uses the exact same Greek term. So how is this somehow an improvement you see, in all of the synoptic gospel issues that were raised, there was an assumption made of a certain theoretical formulation that somehow allows us to look into the minds of people rather than allowing those people to be accurate recorders. And of course, most of the differences between the synoptic gospels are due to the fact that Mark has one audience, Matthew has a different audience, Luke has a different audience. Every time, for example, that, that Mark and Matthew tell the same story, Mark tells a fuller version of it than Matthew does. Matthew telescopes things a great deal at that particular point in time. And so when we keep that in mind, we can see what the differences between the synoptic gospels are. I've got a minute and a half right now, is, is according to my, my, my clock here. So um, just, when you only got 10 minutes, you get everything you can. Let me, let me just put it that way. So the fig tree, the fig tree, I can't believe that people keep bringing the fig tree argument up. Uh, because, again, there, it, just, the, just the difference between Matthew and Mark is, again, due to telescoping, but the idea that, 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 uh, that Jesus didn't know when figs were, it's just so obvious that what's going on here is that the fig tree represents Israel. It has all this showy religiosity, 
and yet it doesn't have any reality. Jesus is going into the temple. He's about to give the Olivet Discourse in regards to the destruction of the temple. And by the way, I never said that there was no harmonization. I have lectured on harmonization over and over again. I was actually paraphrasing Bart Ehrman, who recognizes that the general tendency of scribes was to be very careful in the, scri in the scribal activity that they engaged in. Even Bart Ehrman says that. So I was giving a general statement, and Yusuf has misrepresented my statement as if all the discussion that I've published on, on things such as the pericope adultery and things like that just simply don't exist. So I, I think there needs to be a much more careful reading of the sources. So once again, let's go back to the issue. What is the better way to have this free transmission which allows us to have this discussion or to have a controlled transmission where you have one group in charge and you can't go back and check what they did? That truly is the issue this evening, and we need to see in the next section whether Yusuf addresses that. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, James, and thank you for that um, level of engagement. Um, now, let me review the positive case that I had basically made, which James, unfortunately, and to date, hasn't addressed. You see, he said, and uh, you know, the better, uh, he ended his particular rebuttal by saying, what is it better, to have a controlled text or to have an uncontrolled transmission of the, the, the text? Am I correct? And, and that's the point. It's, it's because of this uncontrolled, wild transmission process that you have, that you have all these particular variations that basically occur. Now let's look at the point that I made and what James' response to that. Number one, I said we don't have any of the original books of the New Testament. Again, James, in his rebuttal, had nothing to say about that because obviously he agrees. I further said that scholars in general have to reconstruct what they believe to be the original. And again, James, in his rebuttal, never rebutted this particular point because that indeed is the case. I further went on to say that the majority of the copies that we have date from the eight. You see, most of the copies are in a minuscule type of writing, and most of them come after the 8th century. The minority, for example, date from prior to the 8th century. And so scholars are left with the idea that they've got a minority of the manuscripts prior to the 8th century, majority after the 8th century, and the vast majority are in fact problematic. James had nothing to say about that. I said that they contain mistakes. James agrees. He says they're insignificant. Then I pointed out certain key passages. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, Mark 16, 9, 20, Luke 24, verse 51. And I said that these particular gospel, uh, 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 writings deal with the issue that are foundational to Christian dogma. Now, we don't care what James may have written in his book 20 years ago. I'm saying to engage an important subject like that tonight. Why is it that as a Greek scholar, as an apologist, you chose not to tell the audience? Bearing in mind that the vast majority of them believe in the story of Jesus. And how many of you still believe in Jesus and the woman caught in the act of adultery? He that is without sin amongst you, let him cast the first stone. You see, you see James, they still believe in that. And that's a problem because regardless of what scholars may or may not say, the millions and billions, what are they believing? So are they believing false? Is it false belief? First epistle of John chapter 5 verse 7. Three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. How many of you still believe in it? You see, James, they still believe in that. And that's the point here, that even though you and I agree that these particular passages are fabrications, then are, what are we saying? Are we saying that they are wrong? That they are going to go to hell because they believe in that? What, what's the point? The point is, can you see the implications that's the issue that we basically have. And again, James will not deal with that because um, he deals with this in his writings, but it's, it's critical. We don't have, it's like having something in the Quran which says that Muhammad is not the last and final messenger of God. That'll be a problem for us Muslims. It'll be, we don't have such a problem. Can you see the difficulty that you have? I dealt with the issue of the evolution of the Gospels and the fact that scholars in general agree that there is a development in terms of the Christology. Here James went on to basically say, I think he made mention about Mark, Mark's usage of the term Kyrios. But what scholars now tell us is that when they refer to Mark, they actually refer to a previous document called Urmarchus, which is a source for Matthew and Luke. So Urmarchus, for example, had the original writings, had basically a, a, an idea of Jesus where he had human limitations, where he was limited in his concept, and the later Gospels and the later writers obviously decided to increase it and change it according to what they basically believed. You mentioned about the fact that the New Testament universally is the same. Well, let me tell you this. In the oldest 
Bible in the world, what's called the Codex Sinaiticus, and you can go to www.codexsinaiticus.org or .co.za, sorry, .com, not .co.za, you'd find that there are books such as the Shepherd of Hermas and the Epistle of Barnabas, which is found to be part of that particular document. Now, if that is the case in the oldest Bible, why is it not in the new, particular New Testament that we have today? Thank you, uh, Professor. It's like an examination. <laughs> um, what else? Look, I just want to be, you know, J James mentioned the issue of Mark, but I, I just want to kind of show that even, 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 let's assume that John gives an accurate account, for example, on um, the so-called divinity of Christ. Look at John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was of God, and the Word was God. And I'd like to engage him on this maybe during the little later session. Most people believe that this is an indication reflecting the divinity of Christ. But yet, if you look at the Greek, it is something like this from memory. I'm not a Greek scholar. NRK, enhologos, kaihologos, enprostontheon, kaithios, enhologos. Now, quite fascinatingly enough, I've got an article here published in the Journal of Biblical Literature, volume 92, uh, page 85. Philip B. Hanna says that such clauses as the one in John 1.1 1, 1, with an anathrous predicate preceding the verb are primarily qualitative in meaning. They indicate that the logos has the nature of the theos. There is no basis for regarding the predicate theos as definite. In John 1.1, 1, 1, I think that the qualitative force of the predicate is so prominent that the noun cannot be regarded as definite. In other words, the theos, if I were to say James is godly, godlike, he's a man of God, it doesn't make him almighty God. You get the point. And what I find problematic here is that even on the assumption that we have the actual text, you've got an apologist, as many apologists do, and a Greek scholar that would have to turn the very basis of Greek grammar upside down in order to justify their particular theological viewpoint. Even though John 1.1, 1, 1, the Theos, does not indicate that the Logos is Almighty God, and it's basically, according to Philip Garner, um, uh, there is no basis for regarding the Theos as definite, you'd find that people in the world will have to manipulate, change, misinterpret, in certain instances, even change their understanding of Greek grammar in order to prove and substantiate a particular theological point. So can you see the problem we have? Most of the examples that I gave you up there, which James says that he was aware of, and he's obviously probably is aware of, indeed, those were deliberate alterations. Can you see, whoever is angry without a just cause, the word without a just cause is not there. But when you remove without a just cause, what does it mean? Whoever is angry is in danger of the judgment. Jesus himself became angry. So the scribes thought that, look, if they were to include the word without a cause, it would, in a sense, vindicate Jesus. Or, for example, where it speaks about the purification, their purification, Ma uh, Mary's, Joseph, and Jesus. The scribes change it to her purification. Why? Because if it was their purification, how can Almighty God be defiled? How does He need to be purified? So can you see that these are deliberate changes that are being made? And it's not honest scholarship, no honest apologetics to say that these are not significant. Yes, we know them now. But despite the fact that we know that, James, it hasn't changed the mindset of millions and millions of Christians today. They still believe in the story of Jesus and the woman caught in the act of adultery. They still subscribe to the doctrine of Trinity. Most of them still believe, even in my hotel room, it has 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. It has the ascension of Jesus. And these are critical to Christianity. What do you do in those particular circumstances and instances? I don't believe I misquoted or took out of context what Kurt and Barbara Allen said. They inform us about the various problems in the committee, and they quite clearly say that a committee text of this kind is occasionally regarded as problematical, and at times it may be so. In a number of instances, it represents a compromise, for none of the editors can claim a perfect acceptance record of all recommendations offered. Meaning, if there are recommendations that the text should be this, someone will disagree. No, that the text should say this. Can you see all oh, are certain passages that are not there? The text is agreed by a committee. Where they disagreed on the best reading to print, they voted. What we have are working editions. What's a working edition? A working edition is like a draft. It's not your final product. It's a working edition. 
And the working edition in the present scenario with the Nestle aligned um, New Testament is in the 27th edition. So it's going to be a 28th, maybe a 29th, maybe a 30th. The more and the more manuscripts are studied. Can you see the problem? Can you see the difficulty we have with that? We don't have problems like that with the Quran. If every single Quranic text was burnt in the world today, every one of them, burn them all, put them on a bonfire, will we be able to reconstruct the Quran? Yes. Because it's in the minds and the hearts of the people. And that is the difference between the New Testament and that is the difference between the Quran, which will deal forthcoming. Thank you. 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 Thank you text in the New Testament and the problems that we have. And certainly James is going to raise, you know, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a statement called inconsistency is a sign of a failed argument. Who made that up? Me. And actually it's James' quotation. Inconsistency is a sign of a failed argument. And we're going to probably see that there is going to be a level of inconsistency here. Even though that there are few variations in the Quranic text, James is going to make a mountain out of a molehill and we'll see how it goes as the discussion goes on. Is the Quran a reliable record of the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad? Number one, the Arabic word Quran is derived in the opinions of many scholars from the verb qara, meaning to read. The Prophet was keen to preserve the text of the Quran to convey the message to humankind. The Quran is regarded as divine in origin and with regards to the Prophet's intense interest in this regard and he's obedient is to this particular dictum in Surah 15 verse 9 you read the expression inna nahnu nazzalna zikra wa inna lahu lahafizun indeed it is we who send down the Quran and indeed it is us who will be its guardian you see even though you believe that the Quran is not the word of God this verse gives an indication who is this us who is this we it's as if God himself is speaking can you see that this is part of the tidings of things unseen that we reveal unto thee, O Muhammad, by inspiration. Even though you might not believe that the Quran is the word of God, reading it gives you an indication that it sounds to be like the word of God, as if God is speaking. So the preservation of the text is considered critical in the Quranic text itself. That's not the case in the Bible. You don't find mention where God says, I'm going to preserve the New Testament. I'm going to preserve this as mine. The Quranic revelation started in 610. In one of the surahs, it tells the prophet, do not move your tongue with it to make haste. Surely on us rests the collecting of it and the recitation of it. So number one, the prophet was well aware that there was a possibility that the Quran could be distorted intentionally. And so in the hadith literature, there are indications where he announced to his followers that any other writings you have, like hadith, secondary traditions, what the prophet said, did, wrote, ate, how he behaved, all of that was written in the hadith that was to be scrapped out, eliminated, in order to preserve the Quranic text, in case additions are basically added. Number one, the Prophet asked his scribes to write down each verse after revelation. Number two, he recited the Quran during prayers, as we do it today. Number three, he asked his companions to recite it in front of him. Number four, he urged, ordered those who had learned the Quran to teach those who had not learned. You see, today in the Muslim world, there is a tradition called Hibs, Hafezun, where we memorize the Quran. I might not know a single word of Arabic, not understand it, but I can memorize it from beginning to end. That's a tendency that you have in the Muslim world today, that they can recite the Quran in Arabic without understanding it. Even people who don't understand the Quranic text, it's that easy to memorize. Number five, number six, he made the learning of the Quran a, a scale of piety amongst Muslims. He said, with this book, Allah exalts some people and lowers others. He urged Muslims to make a practice of reading the Quran. He gave the privilege of leading the prayers to those who had memorized it. And he condemned the forgetting of memorized verses as a grievous sin. So number one, transmission of the text was critical. Then you've got a passage like this here in Surah 80 verse 11 to 16. By no means indeed it is a message of instruction. Therefore whoever wills should remember it on leaves, purified, held in honor, exalted, written in the hands of scribes, noble and pious. James says that this possibly refers to angels, but I've looked at four different Quranic translations. Muhammad Asad, Muhammad Ali, Yusuf Ali, Muhammad Yuk Pekatol, all give the indication that this in fact refers to scribes writing the Quran in the time of the Prophet. 
So to sum up, the Prophet did his best and imposed all precautions to keep the Quranic text both in pure form, oral, and in written form, although it was not compiled in a book in his time. And one might wonder, why is it that the Prophet did not order one official copy to be kept? You see, in the time of the Prophet, there was no book called the Quran. There was no book called the Quran in a book like this here. And why was that not the case? It's because of the fact that verses of the Quran were being revealed to him continuously up until the day he died. And so even up to the last day, the book was open. And so the, the multi-readings of the text could not fit one sole particular written copy. Therefore, one cannot say that there was any obscure zone when referring to the history of the Quran as there was when it concerning the history of the text of the New Testament. You see, there's an obscure zone when you look at the history of the text of the New Testament, which is not there in the Quran. The earliest record of the Quran was basically written seven years before the Hijrah when the Quran was being revealed. This is in the Hadith literature, which speaks about Omar's conversion, that his sister had a parchment that one of the companions had brought for with him to teach her family. So you see that we've got... Um, uh, traditions indicating that there was a written text that was available in the time of the Prophet himself. Besides the above verses which refers to the Quran's form, there are also a number of hadith which agree with the above verses. Zaid, who's a scribe, is reported to say, we used to compile the Quran from small scraps in the presence of the messenger, meaning they used to write it on scraps of paper, on blade, on stone, on bark tree. The above hadith tells us that the Prophet Muhammad was not only unaware of the condition, was not unaware of the condition of the Quran, and also it tells us that the Quran used to be compiled for the Prophet Muhammad, meaning that he possibly had an earlier copy, his own personal copy. Malik said no one should carry the mashab by its strap. Mashab means book, nor on a pillow unless it's clean. So it's clear that the Quran was available in some type of written form during the time of the Prophet. Qatada in the Hadith said, I was asked by Anas ibn Malik, who collected the Quran at the time of the Prophet? He said four, all of whom were from the Ansar, Ubay ibn Kaab, Muad ibn Jabal, Zaid ibn Tabit, and Abu Zaid. So it's very clear then that in one sense, you could say a written form of the Quran was available at the time of the Prophet. And that particular proof is inescapable, which contradicts or challenges any hadith which presents the opposite. Why was the Quran not compiled in one entire book during the time of the Prophet? As I mentioned, there was a continuous revelation. Arrangement of surahs and verses were not chronological. Numerous companions memorized the Quran and there was no pressing need during the lifetime of the Prophet. You see, the first chapter of the Quran is not the first revelation. The 96th chapter is in fact the first revelation. So if today I were to take the Quran and I would to change the order and arrangement of the surahs, it would still be the same Quran. I can start with Surah Baqarah, Surah Yasin, Surah Maida, Surah An Nisa. It will still be the same textual Quran. More importantly, the oral transmission of the text. Even today, many people completely memorize the Quran, and these people are known as Hafizun. And I challenged earlier on. I said that look, if you were to destroy all the copies of the Quran, every single copy we burn them, like that chap in the United States wanted to burn them. Let's assume we burn them, we create a bonfire and burn them. Will we be able to construct the Quran? Yes, why? Because people memorize it. In a secular 21st century society, there are millions and millions of Hafizun. Every Ramadan, when we go to the mosque, we recite the Tarawih, Salah, where you recite the entire Quran from beginning to end by memory. And each one knows the text. If we were to burn and destroy every single New Testament manuscript and book and Bible in the world, would we be able to reconstruct it? How? How can we reconstruct the New Testament? Have we had anyone memorizing the entire Bible from cover to cover? Impossible. Where, where have you seen that? Can you give me a... Where has it happened? It hasn't happened at all. And that's a difficulty that we have here. The first man to speak the Qur'an loudly in Mecca was someone called Abdullah ibn Masood. And we told that the Prophet's companions came together, mentioned that the Quraysh had never heard the Qur'an distinctly. Quraysh were those who were the pagans. And when ibn Masood came and he started reciting, then they subsequently got up 
and began to hit him in the face, but he continued to read it so far as God willed that he should read. Now, I don't know, but in a debate with Shabir Ali, James White says that Ibn Masood was beaten to death because he was apparently, forgive me if I'm wrong, James's indication was that apparently he may have been reciting the Quran differently, and so he was beaten to death. Am I correct? And, and when Shabir Ali questioned him, where did he get his source? He said, well, he got it from a book called An Introduction to the Sciences of the Quran. So I decided to bring myself a copy of that book, and I've got it here. And I want James White to show us in his session, and perhaps a rebuttal, where in this book does it say that Ibn Masood had been reciting the Quran differently and was beaten to death? That's a source for James. So I brought it here, and I'm going to leave it on the desk so when James White comes, he can probably give me a reference to something that I have perhaps not seen. So what you basically find here is that Hafizun had basically memorized it. The prophet uh, ensured memorization. The prophet said the most superior amongst you are those who learn the Quran and teach it. There are numerous hadith giving account of the various efforts made. And in addition to that, that was my challenge today. And that's my challenge to James. The Quran was memorized by hundreds of Muslims and those who had met the prophet. Just as a whole Quran was preserved by writing, the Quran was preserved by memorization. Was the New Testament preserved in this particular manner? And the answer is no. And that's why we have the difficulties that we see today. And that's a more, in my view, honest perspective of addressing and looking at these particular texts without wanting to necessarily score points uh, against each other in any particular given fashion. Now, after the Prophet had died, during the caliphate of the Prophet of uh, Abu Bakr, there was a battle which took place called the Battle of Yamama. And in this battle, not Yomama, the Battle of Yamama, um, <laughs> in this battle, many people <laughs> had memorized the Quran and they were martyred. Those Hafizun were in fact martyred. So Abu Bakr feared that the Quran might possibly be lost by virtue of the fact that a number of Hafizun had basically martyred and they had not had a complete copy available with them at that time. So in view of the fact that a number had been there, what he did was he ordered an individual called Zaid ibn Thabit, who was a personal scribe of the Prophet, and Zaid finished the job perfectly. Now, James makes a point in the Hadith which refers to the fact that Zaid, a scribe, compiled the Quran in a kind of a book form. He says, how can I do something which Allah's apostle has not done? Meaning that in the time of the Prophet, you never had a Quran in this kind of book form, cover to cover. You never had that. So Zaid is asking, how can I do something which was not done in the time of the Prophet? But that doesn't mean that the Quran was not written in the time of the Prophet, but it means that the Quran was scattered and not collected in one particular volume. And what the Prophet did is that he didn't leave the complete Quran in a single volume. Why not? Because the vast majority of his companions had memorized it. I mean, look at it from this perspective. We are a thousand years later. We are secular people. And yet today, so many people, 1.5 billion, who take their faith seriously, can memorize their Quran and recite it to the T. So if I have to, for example, open this and you recite it, I can confirm what's in this particular book. Wouldn't it be possible, or similar, or, or greater, that in the time of the Prophet, the process of memorization and the concern for preserving the text of the Quran, which would be far more greater than it is in the 21st century? I thought I had an hour. <laughs> I'm joking. Thank you. So that's basically the reason, and that's a hadith that gives you an indication in terms of that. Then there are other passages in the hadith where Zaid says, I found with Khuzayma two verses of Surah Tawbah, which I had not found with anybody else. In other words, the hadith collection. We don't have a manuscript which says this. We have a hadith which says that in the process of collecting the text of the Quran, Zaid was collecting parchments and he found other verses. What does the words of Zaid mean? That doesn't mean that the Quran was not written. It basically means effectively that those particular written verses were only to be found in the possession of an individual called Khuzayma, meaning it may not have been written elsewhere, but it would be written in this particular. It, it's like this. If someone has to memorize 
the, uh, an essay, all of you memorize the same essay, and you come to an examination, and someone has the last paragraph of the essay, and I'm trying to look at all your writings that you particularly possess, and I basically discover only the last paragraph of an essay with one particular individual, it doesn't mean that none of you know what the last paragraph is. And that's the case here. It doesn't mean that that was a new verse that he particularly discovered. And on that point, what we can note is that the collection of Abu Bakr was meant to preserve the Quran in its entirety and ensure that none of the actual verses were in fact lost. During the period of Khalif Osman, the third Khalif of Islam, Abu Bakr, um, Omar, Osman, and Ali, Islam spread to many areas. And what then subsequently happened is that, this looks better, Muslims who were not Arabs couldn't read the Quranic text. So they changed the meaning of the verses and many variant readings sprung out because the people were ignorant of the particular Arabic. All Arabic was written as lines and now one can distinguish such and such alphabets easily by marks. But this was not the case in the older times. So what happened here was that the Uthmanic copy limited the accepted readings to what was the skeleton of the Arabic consonantal text. Now let me explain this to you. In Hebrew and in Arabic, both are without vowels in the classical period. The vowelization is there to aid you in respect of your pronunciation. But without the vowelization, so it's possible that a particular style of recitation which would technically be viewed as a variant and that would then subsequently circulate at a particular point in time and would unnecessarily create disputes. So to ensure the accuracy of one copy, what Uthman did was he set out five groups of educated reciters, reciters, each had a particular copy of the written Quran and they would proceed under the watchful eye of the teachers. And he ordered Zaid bin Thabit, the scribe that I mentioned, to teach the people of Medina the, with the Mus'haf of Medina and others in respect of how it should be recited. And so the Uthmanic project resulted in the making of several copies of the Quran which were sent to the largest cities of the Islamic State with one copy being kept in the capital. That's in Al-Medina. All the companions of the Prophet were alive at the time, approved of what Uthman was doing as stated by Musab, the son of the companion of Saad ibn Abi Waqqas. You see, James said, well, he'd prefer a, a free transmission as opposed to a controlled transmission. A text by government is a problem. I agree, if anything comes from the government, I would view it in South Africa, certainly, with the greatest degree of caution. But the point here is that the, the copy that was, in a sense, in inverted commas, authenticated by Uthman, which he in a sense made several copies of. The companions at the time of the Prophet, who were present when the Quran was being revealed, had obviously seen the copy of Uthman. So if there was a divergent difference in terms of what was originally there, then James, isn't it probable that they would have raised a significant objection? I mean, it stands to reason. James says, well, I cannot accept a controlled text. And I'm saying that, well, look, in actual fact, it wasn't controlled per se. What he was simply doing was eliminating those readings that were creating problems. And the companions who were present at the time of the prophet had heard the Quran from the prophet, were now with Uthman, would obviously have made a major created major consternation had the Uthmani copy been significantly different. And that's the point. Could there be any doubt about the faithfulness of the particular Uthmani text? No. Why not? Because the short span of the time between the death of the Prophet and the distribution of the written copies of the Uthmani Mas'haf was only 13 to 15 years. 13 to 15 years. When's your earliest manuscript? When's the earliest manuscript in the New Testament? The second century. So compare the, the second century, 200 years, 150 years, to 15 years. Are you telling me that the text prior to the Uthmanic collection was significantly different? If that was the case, why is it that the companions of the Prophet never had any issue with what Uthman did?
Number two, the dedication and eagerness of the Islamic State. Number three, Uthman used the original text at the time of Abu Bakr. So Abu Bakr used Zaid bin Thabit to collect the various writings that were there. He commissioned the scribe Zaid bin Thabit. And what Uthman did was he used the official copy of Abu Bakr. And those companions who were present at the time of the Prophet saw what Uthman did. If there was any difference in the text of Uthman, they would have had a major issue with it, which they didn't. And so other copies which are not from Uthman were basically burnt. But burning is not a negative act. You see, today, if I want to get rid of the Quran, what would I do? I'd either bury it or I'd burn it. You know that we can burn the copy as a means of disposal? You can bury it. Or bur so burning is not a negative act necessarily in Islam, and that would be the best means of disposal at that particular point in time. And then from the standard copies, more copies were made, and this time there were also teachers of the people to teach them how to recite the Quran. You see, had Uthman not done that, then it would have possibly been the case that what happened to the New Testament would probably have happened to the Quran. And that's why he took this particular steps. And so Christian missionaries have been alleging that Uthman ordered all the copies of the Quran to be burned because of the varying content. Well, suppose that there were at any times variations in the Quran other than those caused by scribal errors or failures of memory or due to some minor differences in script that is suppose that some individuals or groups deliberately held on to a text of the Quran that they knew was different from the one followed by the other how could it happen that from century to century and from country to country we find in principle at least the same text of the Quran and this is acknowledged by the vast majority of scholars. In principle, you've got the same skeletal text. And I'm not talking about rearrangement of surahs or um, minus the addition of an alif. Or, for example, um, a particular verse might be rearranged. The essence is basically the same, looking at it in a providential sense. It is said that Uthman ordered people to burn the text, but is it conceivable that people will submit to this order even if they thought the Uthman's text was not the authentic text. You see, if the companions at the time of the Prophet thought that what Uthman was doing was an aberration, they would have had an issue, a major, major issue with what he had particularly done. If you look at the number of manuscripts that there are in existence of the Quran, James spoke about um, 24,000, if you take the Latin and the Syriac, 5,700 with the Greek. I'm not, um, according to M.M. Azami in the collection of the Quranic text, there are no less than a quarter million manuscripts of the Quranic text. Subject to correction, 450,000 manuscripts of the Quranic text. Com contrast that with 5,700. This is a text called the Palimpsest of the Codex Sana. The Codex is one of the earliest fragments which are found in 1972. What the Yemeni government did was that they commissioned a scholar called Khair Pun to do some sort of study and research on this. He studied until 1980, 83, 84, and then it went on into the hands of another professor. I think it was Hans Kasper Graf von Bothmer for another two years. And interestingly enough, in a letter, uh, after the publication of an article in the Atlantic Monthly where there was a bit of a scandal in terms of what the original Sana manuscript stated, Kherpun said, the most important thing, thank God, is that these Yemeni Quranic fragments do not differ from those found in museums and libraries elsewhere with the exception of details that do not touch the Quran itself, but are rather differences in the way words are spelled. This phenomenon is well known even in the Quran published in Cairo, which is written, You've got variations in the oldest Yemeni Quranic fragments. For example, the phenomenon of not writing the vowel alif is common. Why was the older layer wiped out? You see, the palimpsest is a text over another text where you rub it off and then you write over it. Now, some scholars and apologists and polemists have said, well, the, the text underneath the text showed us a different type of Quran. Well, this is what Khair Pun says. He says, it doesn't necessarily imply an alteration of the very text, since the formative period of the Quranic text already may have been completed when the first script was written. Most probably, the arrangement of the surahs was altered. That's all. 
And this hypothesis is corroborated by the fact that amongst the findings in Sana'a, there are indeed Qur'ans with an arrangement of surahs different from the transmitted Qur'an. So what? If I were to open the Qur'an with surah Yasin, and then I go to surah al Imran, and then I go to surah Fatah, and then I go to surah Nisa, then I go to surah Maryam, is it not the same Qur'an? When you start memorizing the Qur'an, you don't start with Surah Baqarah, you start with the last chapter, Surah Naba, Amma Yatasa'alun. It doesn't matter whether the arrangement of the Surah is the same or not. And that's the point that he was basically making here. Um, and, and, and that's effectively the case that he has in respect of the palimpsest. Um, and that's a source that you basically have. Hans Kasper Graf and Bothma. Gerd Poen, Observations on Early Quranic Manuscripts in Sana. Check it up. There's nothing significantly different. What you need to show us is that there's a Quranic text which was discovered in Sana, which tells us now that the Prophet is not indeed the Prophet, or that Allah is not God, or there's some significant change in dogma or doctrine, like I showed you, about the Trinity, about the Ascension, about the nature of Jesus, about the evolution of Jesus. Show me that in the Quranic text. If you're showing me one or two minor variations, rearrangement of the surahs, perhaps um, misspelling of words, it's meaningless. The consonantal text overall, except for a few variations, are primarily the same. If you look at the Uthmanic text, the Uthmanic Quran, basically, you'd find that also in certain instances, it is written on a palimpsest. And interestingly enough, and I've got the list of uh, differences that are basically here, many of the non-readings in the palimpses of Uthman can be said to be as a result of a faulty reading. For example, there are scribal errors, meaning there's a, there's the, there's a palimpses of Uthman. There's a text, and there's a text which has been rubbed off. In the text that has been rubbed off, it doesn't necessarily correlate with the text that is there. But these mistakes that are in the text that has been rubbed off can be easily seen and have been analyzed by scholars. And I've got them in front of me, and you can make out the difference. Surah 2, verse 20. Fa'ikhwanuhum, instead of fa'ikhwanuhum, ikhwanukum, as a standard reading. Ya'muruna, instead of tu'maruna, which does not fit the context. The palimpsest has al-munafiqeen, which is grammatically incorrect. It should be al-munafiqoon as a standard reading, and so on. But that doesn't necessarily affect the text in a general. It doesn't affect the status of the Quran. The inferior text cannot in any way throw doubt on the integrity of the text. This is a scholar called Angelica Neuwirth. She's a contributor to a book called The Cambridge Companion to the Quran. These are Quranic scholars. These are professors. They study the Quran. This is what she say. New findings of the Quranic text fragments, moreover, can be adduced to affirm rather than to affirm rather than call into question the traditional picture of the text of the Quran as an early fixed text composed of the surahs we have. Nor have scholars trying to deconstruct that image succeeded in seriously discrediting the genuineness of the Quran as we know it. Basically what she's saying that there are lots of people out there that are trying to discredit the Quran, trying to change and suggest that the Quran says something else. It hasn't been accurately preserved in principle and she says they haven't succeeded. I'll give you certain scholars and I know my time is limited. The following excerpts are just views of the Quran by two non-Muslim scholars. James is an apologist. He's not a Quranic scholar. In my like humble humility, I can say I'm not a biblical scholar. But I use the sources of biblical scholars to come to my conclusion. What James has to now do is use the uh, analysis and scholarly works of Quranic scholars. Why is it that in your discussions and debates. You've never gone to the Cambridge Companion of the Quran. You never looked at Angelica Neuvert, for example, or William Montgomery Watt, or, um, for example, um, people, even a classical Orientalist, a bitter Orientalist like William Muir, who says that the text of the Quran is un unimpeachable. Why don't you go to those particular? Why is it that always Christian apologists have to rely on revisionist material? Like, for example, John Wansborough, he says the Quran was developed in the 8th and 9th century. Even though his student, John Burton, says that the Quran that we have today is in principle almost identical to the mushaf that we have in the time of the Prophet Muhammad. So why is it that Christian apologists take it upon themselves to go to either the revisionist or pseudo-scholars in order to substantiate or 
justify their particular point. Look at what Watt and Bell say. They say the very fact that varying and even contradictory deliverances in certain instances have been preserved is strong proof that, with perhaps minor exceptions, we have the whole of what was revealed to Muhammad. On general grounds, it may be concluded that the Uthmanic revision was honestly carried out and reproduced as closely as was possible to the men in charge of it what Muhammad had basically delivered. And effectively, I'll end with a quotation by William Muir who says, William Muir was a hostile critic of Islam, an Orientalist. Maybe he never had access to manuscripts that we have today, but he was hostile to Islam. And he concludes, yet but one Quran has been current amongst the Mohammedans, Muslims. And the constantaneous use by them in all and every age after the present day is an irrefragable proof that what we have now before us is the very text preserved. There is probably in the world no other work which has remained 12 centuries, now 14, with so pure a text. And I leave you at that. If you want to come to the final conclusion, is the Quran a reflection of the teachings of Muhammad? I've in principle pointed out to you that we can at least date it to the very time of the Prophet Muhammad 1400 years ago in contrast to the New Testament. Thank you. Now I'm a little concerned that when we approach these subjects in somewhat of a scattergun effect and we raise all sorts of issues, that the result is that those of you who are trying to follow are not going to be able to follow what the real issues actually are. There are all sorts of things I could raise about the canon, the number of surahs, Ubay ibn Qab and Abdullah ibn Masud. There are all sorts of things I could raise that would be parallels to what Yusuf Ismail did in regards to the New Testament. But I want to remain focused upon the actual thesis of the debate and to focus upon this issue because very clearly what Yusuf is saying is, no, a controlled text is the best way. It is the best way. We want Uthman to make a revision and we want to have that, that, uh, that certainty of that text. And I want to illustrate why that is a bad thing. I do want to just say one thing. If when we're done this evening, if the folks here at the university want to leave the microphone on and we've said good night to everybody, uh, I will go back there, I will put John 1.1 1, 1 in Greek on the screen, and I will take seven minutes to explain to you why it teaches the deity of Christ, and then ask Yusuf to do the same thing from the Greek text. I will do that, it only take 15 minutes, if anybody wants to do that, I make that offer. Uh, but that's not why we're here this evening. The key to the second debate is to apply the same standards here that we did in examining the New Testament. Was the transmission of the Quran a free transmission or a controlled transmission? Well, we already know. Yusuf has already admitted it is a controlled transmission and he believes that that is far better. Muslims, Muslims and non-Muslims both agree that no change, this is, a, this is a, a quote, Muslims and non-Muslims both agree that no change has ever occurred in the text of the Quran. The above prophecy of the eternal preservation and purity of the Quran came true not only for the text of the Quran but also for the most minute details of its punctuation marks as well. Now you just heard Yusuf say that's not the case. Interestingly enough, he said, well, when there are variations, they don't matter. Any variation in the New Testament text does matter, but any variation in the Quranic text doesn't matter, uh, even when it affects the actual meaning of the text. It goes on, that quote goes on to say, it is a miracle of the Quran that no change has occurred in a single word, a single letter of the alphabet, a single punctuation mark, or a single diacritical mark in the text of the Quran during the last 14 centuries. Now, Yusuf has already contradicted this fellow Muslim on this particular subject and has admitted that's not the case. And that's a good thing. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that he has, he has done that. Now, at this point, there is truly no question, as scholarly sources Islamic and non both attest to the exact same story. Uh, for example, uh, in the uh, Al-Mushaf al-Sharif, the top copy manuscript from 2007 published by Turkish scholars, you have a number of pages like this where you have differences in readings of the, ma the major mushaf of the Quran listed. Now this is sort of a beginning, a sort of movement toward a critical edition of, of the Quran, but no critical edition of the Quran exists today. You cannot go by the Nesya Alam, it's currently the 28th edition by the way, 28th edition of the, of the Quran. Uh, if you look at the Arabic Quran, there's not going to be any notes at the bottom that say, well, some Sa'ana manuscripts say this and, and some uh, Palimpsest manuscripts say that. It doesn't exist. 
There are Quran's that note the differences between Harfs and Warsh and some of the other printed editions because the, those, those differences are relevant, but I'm not getting into them this evening. I want to focus upon the real issue, and that is what level of confidence can we have in light of how these texts were transmitted to us? And so here's an example from an Islamic source of where you have variations. Now the question that I have to place before everyone is, how do you know what the original is in light of the current manuscript tradition of the Quran? I just heard it said, 450,000 manuscripts. I challenge that. I want a list. I can give you the list of all the New Testament manuscripts. You can go online, get it right now, look for the New Testament Institute in Munster, uh, Germany. You can find the entire catalog available online. Where is that for the Quran? I've actually had people say there are 5,000 first century manuscripts of the Quran. Where? Where's the list? Uh, I was just looking at islamicawareness.com, uh, I believe is the address, and they have an article there on first century manuscripts of the Quran, and it looks almost identical to the New Testament. There are very few of them. They admit only 87% of the text of the Quran exists in first century manuscripts. Now, may I no make another statement here? Comparing the New Testament and the Quran is apples and oranges. You have in the, in the Quran, is only 56% the length of the New Testament. Did you hear the, the memorization stuff? It's, it's barely half the length of the New Testament. It's only about, what, 14% of the length of the Bible. It's a small book in comparison, and it's a much younger book. It should have an absolutely perfect text, because it's, it's a much younger book than the New Testament. And it wasn't the people who wrote it weren't persecuted for 260 years during the time period where it was being transmitted either, and had to hide their copies. So you're comparing apples and oranges if you don't think about the reality of the history of the text itself. Now, I do want to point out some uh, important texts. Ibn Masud, Surah 222, and Fogg's Palimpsest Manuscript. Now, this is an example of where we have a variation in the text of the manuscripts that we have. The problem is, I can't even tell you whether it's only two sources or three sources. What do I mean, what do I mean by this? Well. I know that the material that I have on the bottom of this screen is from Fogg's Palimpsest Manuscript, but I'm not sure whether that is the Sa'ana number no. one manuscript or not because the sources don't seem to agree. There is no, unlike the New Testament, where we can go and we can look at the manuscripts. For example, Yusuf was saying, well, you go to Codex Sinaiticus and it had these other books in it. Now, he didn't prove that the author thought those were canon. He just assumed that. I've never had anyone even prove that. But, but at least we know what is contained in Codex Sinaiticus. We can go online and find it. We don't even have that level of information about the Quran yet. The level of study of the manuscripts of the Quran is in its infancy at this point in time. And ironically, the motivation for the continuation of that study, the Corpus Chronicum project and things like that, is not primarily found in religious Muslims. It's found in the West. It's not found amongst Muslims, which is an interesting observation. But at the very least, what you have here on the top is the reading from Surah 2, 222 that's found in Uthman's text, it's found in the modern uh, text of the Quran. And then below it, you have what's called the palimpsest reading. Now, now, Yusuf didn't really explain to you what that was, but, but because of the nature of the parchment, you could actually wash off the writing of, of a book and then write something new on top of it. But thankfully, because of the quills, you were actually marking the parchment, and when you use infrared or ultraviolet light, depending on the material, you can read what was originally written underneath it. And so we discover in the Fogg's Palimpsest manuscript and in the Sa'ana manuscript, so possibly even a third reading, again, it's difficult to know, uh, we find another reading. And notice, this is not a simple scribal error, because when we look at this, we discover that there are changes of entire words, changes of grammatical endings, and changes of where the word is in the position in the sentence. Now, that's not, that's not a scribe making a mistake while quoting something uh, in, in the text. This is, this is clearly editing on the part of the later writing. So you have an earlier form of the text in the palimpsest form. All right? Now, if we, we have palimpsest in the New Testament. If we find a textual variant, what do we do? We look at all the other manuscripts we have. But what if you burned all of them? How do you know which one's original? That's the problem with a controlled text. That's the problem with a controlled text. Sure, the vast majority read one way, but how do you know that was the original? How do you know that's not the edited text that has now become the most popular form? That's the problem with controlled transmission. And we have it right here in the text of the Quran. But here is another example. Um, this is from BNF 328A, which is the uh, 
very, very early Quran that is found in the National Library of France in, uh, in Paris. And as you can see on, oops, sorry about that, here we go, as you can now see on the screen, this word right here, and unfortunately the projection isn't overly bright, but this word right here is clearly and obviously a textual variant. You can see, for example, that the Lamids are at a completely different angle than the, what's in the rest of the manuscript. Clearly, something has been scrubbed out and put in here. Now, I don't have the time to go all through it. There's an excellent book over there called Muhammad is Not the Father of Any of Your Men by Dr. Powers that goes through this in a painstaking way. But what you have here is a term that Umar said he knew what it meant, but he never told anybody what it meant. There was a tremendous amount of, of argumentation in the Hadith sources concerning what this word meant and why it was there and its relationship to Surah 4, 176, which happens to be just the very last ayah of Surah 4 as well. Now, you can sort of tell what was originally written if you hold it up to proper light and you can, you can look at it and, and you, can, you can make out most of what was originally written, but here you have a clear emendation in the consonantal text of one of the earliest Qurans. Now, here's where the transmission methodology comes into play. How can we know what the original is? Did someone make a mistake? Someone later on tried to fix it? But that's not the only thing about this particular variant. Let me show you some other things about it. Here is the, the variant in its, in its full, uh, full page, and here you have the variant it's found right there. Again, it's very difficult for me to read that. It's a little bit dark. But that's not the only thing that's important about uh, 328A. Let me show you something else about 328A. Scholars have discovered that there is a missing page and in fact, the arrow is pointing to what's called a stub. Uh, remember how you would fold parchment and, into, into parts. You'd fold into multiple parts and you'd bind them together. So if you cut out one page completely, the opposite side page will also fall out because it, they're bound together in these, these choirs in, in the book itself. And so to keep the book from falling apart, whoever cut this page out between folios uh, 19b and 20a left enough of the page there so the corresponding page wouldn't fall out on the other side. Now, why is this relevant? Why is it relevant? Because the text continues on. Well, what this shows us is that someone was making a purposeful emendation in this copy of the Quran. And if you'll notice, when you look at the next page, and I hope you can see this, notice at the top of this page, the line spacing and lettering is much smaller than it is at the bottom. So what's happened is, Whoever did this made some kind of a change and added something but wanted the addition to look like it continued to flow in the text and so they squished more uh, material onto this page so that it would end at the bottom at the same place that the page they had taken out had ended. And interestingly enough, the added material is Surah 4176, which is directly relevant to the textual variant I just showed you before. So in other words, once they made the change, then they had to physically alter the manuscript to allow them to insert another ayah to explain the change that they made earlier. Now, here you have, I think, indisputable evidence in one of the earliest Qurans, and if you, again, if, if you don't trust me, go to Islamic Awareness and look at their article on the first century uh, manuscripts of the Quran, and they will mention this particular uh, manuscript as one of the few first century manuscripts of the Quran. So you don't have to trust me on it. Now, can I prove, am, am I going to do what Yusuf did and crawl into the mind of the person that did this and go, well, they did it because they wanted to prove this. So they, they were taking this role, because honestly, the material is relevant to the issue of succession in the Islamic Caliphate. And guess what? The biggest issue was going on in the days of Uthman. Who would be his successor? What happened right after him? You have Ali, you have the Shiite split, you have all that stuff taking place right at this very time. And here's documentary evidence that it impacts the earliest text of the Quran and in fact, the Uthmanic text. But I can't crawl into people's minds, and I'm not going to go there. But what I am going to say to you is this demonstrates why you want a freely transmitted text. Because you can't go someplace else and go, well, this one's earlier, and therefore this is the original reading, because you don't have that wide variety of manuscripts 
whereby you can have a corrective. It's just not there. Now, uh, Yusuf has already mentioned the fact that there is a tremendous amount of information in the Hadith itself about the fact that the Quran has a controlled transmission. For example, narrated Zayd bin Thabit, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq went for, uh, for me when the people of Yamama had been killed, i.e. a number of the Prophet's companions who fought against Musulaima. Abu Bakr then said to me, Umar has come to me and said, casualties were hot, heavy amongst the Qur'a of the Quran, that is, those who knew the Quran by heart, on the day of the Battle of Yamama, and I am afraid that more heavy casualties may take place among the Qur'a on other battle battlefields, whereby a large part of the Quran may be lost. Now, if I was going to use Yusuf's technique, I would now stand in front of you and say, why didn't Yusuf tell you about this? But I'm not going to do that. But that once whereby a large part, kathir, a large part of the Quran may be lost. If it was all already there, why would there be a fear that if some more of the memorizers die, that a large part might be lost? This is in the actual material that you'll find in Sahih al-Bukhari. Therefore, I suggest you, Abu Bakr, order the Quran be collected. I said to Umar, how can you do something which Allah's apostle did not do? Umar said, by Allah, that is a good project. Umar kept on urging me to accept this proposal till Allah opened my chest for it and I began to realize the good in the idea which Umar had realized. So I started looking for the Quran and collecting it from what was written on palm stalks, thin white stones, and also from the men who knew it by heart, till I found the last verse of Surah al Taba, Surah 9, Repentance, with Abu Khazami al Ansari, and I did not find it with anybody other than him. He did not find that one verse with anybody but in the memory of one person. Just one person. That is a reason for concern. That particular verse is, Verily, there has come to you an apostle Muhammad from amongst yourselves. It grieves him that you should receive any injury or difficulty till the end of Surat Bara Al-Taba. This is uh, Bukhari 9, 128 through 129. Then a little bit later on, what you read is then, the complete manuscripts, copy of the Quran, remained with Abu Bakr till he died, then with Umar till the end of his life, then with Hafsa, the daughter of Umar. Hudaifa bin al-Yaman came to Uthman. Hudaifa was afraid of there, the people of Sham and Iraq's differences in the recitation of the Quran. So he said to Uthman, O chief of the believers, save this nation before they differ about the book, the Quran, as Jews and Christians did before. So there was a concern. We don't want to be like those Jews and Christians arguing about their book. So we need an official version. So Uthman sent a message to Hafsa saying, send us the manuscripts of the Qur'an so that we may compile the Qur'anic materials in perfect copies and return the manuscripts to you. Hafsa sent it to Uthman. Uthman then ordered uh, Zayd bin Thabit, Abdullah bin Azuz Zabir, Zayd bin Alas, and uh, Abdur Rahman bin Harith bin Hisham, and could be slower to read, to rewrite the manuscripts in perfect copies. Uthman said to the three Qurayshi men, in case you disagree with Zayd bin Thabit on any point in the Qur'an, then write it in the dialect of Quraysh. The Qur'an was revealed in their language. So this was not just simply a, a well, we're just going to take this one manuscript, we're going to rewrite it and, and distribute this. This is a complete revision. They did so, and when they had written many copies, Uthman returned the original manuscripts to Hafsa. Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of what they had copied and ordered that all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burned. Now Yusuf said, why did they do that? Because if they didn't, it would be like the New Testament. In other words, you'd have other sources to make sure that Uthman got it right. And what if it was different? It would be in variation. So if you, want to just, if, you, if you don't want to know what was originally written and you just want certainty, this is the way to do it. But if you want to know what was originally written, this is not the way to do it. This is not the way to do it. Now, interestingly enough, Zayd bin Thabit added a verse from Surat Azab was missed by me when we copied the Quran and I used to hear Allah's apostle reciting it so we searched for it and found it with Qazaymi bin Thabit al-Ansari that verse was among the believers are men who have been true to their covenant with Allah uh, Surah 33, 23 so here was a verse that was not in the, the compiled manuscript that was made right after the time of Muhammad it was only in the mind of one person what about those people that died at Yamama what if they had one of those verses could something be missing that is a question that we have to ask now Interestingly enough, we have a Christian who gives testimony in regards to this subject. There was a man by the name of Al-Kindi, and Al-Kindi wrote a book uh, sometime around 820 AD or so, in which he dialogues with a Muslim. It is a fascinating work. Let me read some of what he says at this very early period of time. 
The result was that in the Caliphate of Uthman, it was discovered that there was no consent instead of the true text. One man then read one version of the Quran, his neighbor another, and differed. One man said to his neighbor, my text is better than yours, while his neighbor defended his own. So additions and losses came about and falsifications of the text. Uthman was told that various versions were in use, that the text was being tampered with, and that strife with all the mischief of party spirit was being engendered. They said, we do not believe that matters can continue as they are. It is an affair of urgency. They are slaying one another. The sacred book is corrupted. A second apostasy is imminent. Ubay, the son of Ka'ab, was dead before it was made, while Ibn Masud refused to give up his copy of the Quran, so they drove him from his post in Kufa and appointed Abu Musa as governor in his place. That will be relevant to my response to uh, what he brought up in regards to Yasser Qadi's book later on. When the revision had been completed according to the various manuscripts, four copies were made in large text, one of which was sent to Mecca, a second remained in Medina, a third was sent to Syria, and is today in Malatya. Interesting, Al-Kindi even knows where they were sent at this early period of time. Next, Uthman gave instructions, directions, I'm sorry, that the leaves and sheets of the Quran should be gathered in from the provinces. He ordered his agents to collect all that they could lay their hands on and destroy them till it should be certain that not a sheet remained in the possession of any private individual. Heavy penalties were threatened against the disobedient. All the leaves they could secure were shredded and boiled in vinegar till they were sodden. Nothing remained, not even the smallest fragment that could be deciphered. Sounds like a real project here that Al-Kindi is talking about. You know what happened between Ali, Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, how they hated each other and quarreled and corrupted the text, how each one tried to oppose his neighbor and to refute what he had said. Pray, how are we to know which is the true text, and how shall we distinguish it from the false one? This was Al-Kindi's question early on in the period of interaction between Christians and Muslims. He knew about the same materials that, uh, that Bukhari depended upon in the collection of his hadith as well. And so the real question, once again, which methodology gives us the most certainty as to the real question? Do we possess the original words of the authors we believe to have been inspired of God? The free transmission of the New Testament text precludes editing and revision. What he said was, well, look, a later scribe said this. How does he know a later scribe said that? Because he knows what the original is. He knows what the earlier reading is. It's amazing when I hear critics saying, oh, well, look at this. A later scribe said that. Well, you know that he changed it because why? Because we know what the earlier scribes had said. That's why. But if, you've dis but if you destroyed the earlier scribe's material, how would you know when someone changed it later on? You see, that's the difference between a free transmission and a controlled transmission. So the free transmission of the New Testament text precludes editing revision, and the manuscript tradition shows us tenacity. The original readings still exist. Even when later scribes harmonize things, possibly just because they had memorized it, Matthew, and marks the, it marks the shorter one or the longer one, uh, just when they're writing because they've memorized it in another one, they do it without even trying to, or because they were trying to make Matthew, Mark, and Luke read the same way, we still know what they were changing from because we have such a wide manuscript tradition. That's what's so important about this particular issue. But the controlled but the controlled transmission of the Quran, together with the Uthmanic revision, the possible later work of Abd al-Malik, which I can't even get into this evening, and the evidence of the differing traditions of Ibn Masud, Ubay ibn Qab, and possibly others found at Sana'a, raises serious questions as to the originality of the Uthmanic tradition. And the simple fact of the matter is, the Islamic community is not in a position as yet, in light of the infancy of the studying of the manuscripts of the Quran in the early period, to make a decision on these matters. It is pure tradition for the Muslim to say, ah, Uthman, this is it. Well, look, I have King James only friends who say, ah, King James only, this is it. Well, the King James wasn't the first one. That wasn't even the first English translation. So you, the question we have to ask ourselves is, what do we want to know? What was originally written or what our community wants us to think was originally written? Folks, there are people who are willing to trade truth for certainty. But then you really don't have certainty do if you don't have the truth. This is a very, very important issue. Islamic scholars and apologists must recognize that merely asserting the perfection of the Uthmanic tradition proves nothing. The realities of the variant traditions must be embraced and examined before the Quran can be proven to have been accurately transmitted to us in this day. Now, okay, yeah, that's, that's what I've got right there. Now, 
it was said, well, there couldn't be any changes whatsoever because all of this stuff had been memorized. I want to read you. Uh, this is in one of the footnotes in, uh, in my book, uh, What Every Christian Needs to Know About the Quran. Uh, this is very, very interesting. Uh, Al-Tabarani reports, this is uh, Sahih al-Bukhari 6.8. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, that was the previous one. Uh, Sayyuti reveals a, a relevant story here. This is uh, Jalad and Sayyuti. He says, Al-Tabarani reports in the work of Al-Kabir that Ibn Umar said, two men used to recite a chapter taught to them by the Prophet. One night they awoke to pray only to find they were unable to recall even one letter of that chapter. The next morning they went to the Prophet to inform him of what had transpired. He said, it is of those parts of the Quran that have been abrogated, so ignore it. We were asked, which is better, to have a smaller book, a smaller, newer book that's memorized, or to have a wide documentary evidence of a larger book that was in written form? I suggest to you, it's far better to have written documentation than the memories of anybody. Uh, when I did a debate on this very subject in, uh, in London, uh, my opponent tried to get someone who had memorized the Quran to come up and to, to quote what he would put on the screen. It ended up being a debacle because they didn't communicate well and he really wasn't able to do it and it didn't work out right. But the point is man's memory is not nearly as good as man's pen. And the reality is the fundamental difference in the presentation of the New Testament is far better than the memories of man because it is based on documentation. In fact, what I'll do is I'll explain this. I made a mistake in the first debate I did with, uh, with Shabir Ali. It wasn't about the fact there are lots of sources, uh, the Encyclopedia of Islam and, and the Encyclopedia of the Quran, all sorts of sources that talk about the fact that there was a split between uh, Ibn Masud and, uh, and Uthman. And a number of sources report that Ibn Masud was beaten and that he died of his, of his wounds later on. Uh, some of the sources just say that he was removed from his post there in Kufa. But there was clearly a, a division at that particular point in time. But when Shabir Ali asked me, about what my source was. When I went back to my materials, my footnotes were all in HTML. Anybody ever read HTML in, in direct text? And I read the footnote above the actual source that I had. Interestingly enough, within two weeks on my blog, I wrote about this and provided the sources right there. For some reason, Yusuf either wasn't aware of that or didn't look at that. But you see, I made a mistake, and it was a mistake of sight. I looked at the wrong footnote, HTML will do that to you, and the footnote was below it. Now, the fact of the matter is, those sources still exist, but we make mistakes. And I'm awful glad that I wasn't the only one that had that information. Other people had that information, and so the information didn't get corrupted because I was the only one that had it. In other words, there's been a free transmission of that information. But when you have a controlled transmission, once somebody makes a mistake, it becomes the standard. It becomes the standard. And so my whole point to you all this evening is, I could sit here and point out that, for example, Ibn Masud, uh, Ibn Masud told his people, and I provide the, the citations and what every Christian needs to know about the Quran, there's numerous citations of the Hadith. Ibn Masud told his people, hold on to your manuscripts, don't give them up. Why? Because Uthman was saying to do so. And scholarly materials demonstrate that the readings of Ibn Masud continued in the manuscript tradition for hundreds of years. And so I just simply ask any Muslim in the audience, upon what basis do you know, given that, given that when Muhammad himself in the Hadith was asked, who do we go to to know the Quran, Ibn Masud was one that was mentioned, Uthman was not. How do you know that Ibn Masud's readings are not right, where he differed from Uthman? The early Tafsir literature is replete with references to variations in the manuscripts. They were not embarrassed by it. Only later, Tafsir literature removes those things. And so it was the reality of your text. Yours is a written, handwritten text. Since it's a handwritten text, it has a history. The history of mine is wide open. Every single variant that Yusuf mentioned about the New Testament, I already knew about, have written about most of them, and lectured about most of them. And anyone who's studying textual criticism here at this university would have address, access to all that information. Nothing is hidden. But my Muslim friends, how do you know what Ibn Masud's readings were? Where do you go? How can you find the information? There's no critical text that gives you that information. And once there is, what are you going to do with it? 
What are you going to do when the Corpus Chronicum project actually pulls all this stuff together and gives you the variant readings in the Sa'ana Palimpsest manuscripts and, and things like that? What are you going to do with the variant readings? How are you going to weigh them against one another in light of the Othmanic revision that destroyed many of the manuscripts that could have given us such insight into what the original was? I suggest to you that it is far better. Now, some of you sat out here and, you, and you're troubled. You say, you say, James, do you, do you not believe that the Pericope Adultery is original? No. Why? Because it doesn't appear in any manuscript until 500 years after Jesus. And even when it does appear there, it doesn't just appear in John. In some manuscripts, it appears in Luke. Now, when you've got a story looking for a place to land, it ain't original. Nothing new about that. I've, I've taught on that forever. But you see, we have a basis for looking at the, those subjects. We have a basis for making decisions about those subjects. And I say to my Muslim friends, what's your basis? We have to use even scales, apply the same standards, apply the same methodologies. That's the mark of truth. Thank you very much. Now they will have 10 minutes to, for rebuttals. And first, Yusuf will have the floor. Thank you for that, James. Isn't it interesting how James quite easily skirts over the issues? that despite him talking about many Quranic variants, he couldn't even explain to us what the actual variants were that he was showing. He can have explained it to any of us. Can he read the script itself? There are only a minority of scholars in the world today can read the script. And the most that he showed in respect of the Fox Palimpsest was what? A rearrangement of words? And that's a variant. It's like this saying, I am going to the Sand Lab Auditorium tonight. And you had Yoda from Star Wars, what would he say? Am I going to the Sanlam Auditorium tonight? The point I'm trying to say is that a rearrangement of words doesn't detract from the fact that you've got the same text in essence, in principle. There is no variation in respect of that. Now let me review some of the positive points and my positive case that I pointed out to vindicate the position that the Quran today is in fact the reliable record of the teachings of Muhammad, which James in fact agrees to because when, when I send an email to him and I propose this particular topic, he says, well, you know, in principle he doesn't have an issue. You remember the email, James, that you said that in principle it is in fact the reliable record of the teachings of Muhammad. So why didn't you tell the audience that tonight? Why is it that you came up with these red herrings um, in respect, well, I can get the emails out for you. Uh, he says basically both the New Testament and the Quran in principle can be reliably traced back to either Jesus or the Prophet Muhammad. We can go back to that. But let me review some of the positive points that I made. Number one, I said that the Prophet was aware of the potential to corrupt the text and instructed that anything outside of the Quran be destroyed. James had nothing to respond to this. Anything outside the Quran which means the hadith. The hadith tradition, such as Bukhari. Anyone heard of Bukhari? Those non-Muslims out here. How many, when was Bukhari compiled? Bukhari was compiled about two to three hundred years after the demise of the Prophet. And that's his source, which I conventionally used to discuss the development of the Quran, and which he uses as a basis to discuss the development of the Quranic text and the problem. So, so he has to rely on a source which dates two to three hundred years after the death and demise of the Prophet. I mentioned further the point that the Prophet had posed or had created all precautions to keep the Quranic text pure in both the oral form and the written form. James had nothing to say about this. I said that the Quran contain passages in written form during the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Again, James never rebutted this particular point. I said the earliest Quran was written about seven years before the Hijra, when the Quran was being revealed, when the sister of Omar had a parchment in her possession. James had nothing to say about this. I gave four reasons why the Quran was not compiled in a book form in the time of the Prophet. Again, James had nothing to say about this. And what he did raise and I'm going to come to some of these points which he has raised. For example, um, on the top of my head, he makes reference to the work of a Christian polemicist called Al-Kindi. Do you remember that? He spoke about Al-Kindi, and Al-Kindi uh, writing 
about Islam and the development of the Quran and seeming to suggest that there were certain problems in the development of the text of the Quran. It's coming from a work called The Apology of Al Kindi. Who is Al Kindi? Al Kindi is a Christian polemicist. His full name was Abdul Masih ibn Ishaq Al Kindi. And his work called The Apology of Al Kindi, the earliest surviving manuscripts of Al Kindi date to when? The 17th century. As late as the 17th century, and you are relying upon a work which is written by a Christian polemicist who was purportedly commissioned by Peter the Venerable in the 11th century, and you're using that to go and attack the credibility of the Quran. You know what that is equivalent to? It's like me using the books and the fiction of Dan Brown to attack the integrity of the New Testament and the Old Testament. I'm using the fictional writings of Dan Brown to say that the Bible is fictional. But that's what James does. Some scholars like William Muir don't even know if Al-Kindi existed. For example, William Muir, the, uh, the um, Orientalist in the 18th, 19th century, he says he acknowledged difficulties in even obtaining a reliable version of the text. Scholars such as P.S. van Koningsveld continue to argue whether the letters derive from actual persons or represent a work of fiction by a single author. And that's one of the sources that James uses in attacking the credibility of the Quran. Why didn't he quote you a single Quranic scholar? I, I don't, maybe I missed something out. But why is it that James, in his discussion, never quoted you a single Quranic scholar of note? Even one from the School for Oriental and African Studies. You could have quoted Patricia Crone or Michael Cook, who are revisionists. Why, didn't he, why does he rely on secondary sources and secondary material in respect of his discussions? This is one source that he could have refer, referred to, the concise encyclopedia of Islam, which he made reference to in principle without discussing what it says about the development of the Quranic text. He says in the concise encyclopedia of Islam, only the canonical Arabic text as collected and compiled under the Caliph Uthman with the consensus of the companions may be recited in one of the seven acceptable versions of the punctuation and vocalization. So for example, where you find even possible variations in recitation, that in Islamic law terminology would be described as sabata ahruf, meaning the seven authentic readings in terms of which you can recite the Quran. So for example, in today, in the Hafs and Nafi, if I were to recite in Arabic, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, ar rahmani Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin. If I were to go to the Maghrib to Morocco, they would recite it like, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, ar rahmani Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin. So can you see Maliki Yawmiddin and Maliki Yawmiddin. One is owner of the Day of Judgment, the other is king of the Day of Judgment. Essentially, it basically says that God is either owner or king of the Day of Judgment. It doesn't detract from the message. So can you see that the, that the, that the so-called red herrings he was raising doesn't really affect the text itself? He mentioned about the palimpsest and the underlying reading within the text. Well, I would urge him, and I don't know how much study he has done on, in, in terms of Quranic scholarship, but there are two contemporary studies in the history of the inferior texts that are being done in the world today. One is by someone called Behnam Sagdegi. The other is Asma Hilali. And what they point out that the palimpsest that you find uh, and the underlying writing that may be there is possibly not a codex of the Quranic text but a school book dedicated to help the memory of the student learning the Quranic text. And I pointed out to you, I've got about 20 examples in terms of which the variations exist in the palimpsest and where you can actually point out that is not uh, what the actual reciting is. For example, um, I gave you an example in Surah 2 verse 220 that instead of the word فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ the, 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 the writing proceeds that underneath the text reads فَإِخْوَانُهُمْ as is a standard reading but it doesn't fit the context because the speech is made direct from the Prophet to the believers. Um, you for example have فَدِيَاتٌ instead of فَدِيَاتٌ كَسَبٌ uh, instead of kasabu, istitanu instead of Fakali instead of Fakuli, Tahum instead of Tahui, Walaka instead of Walakia, Al Naru Jahannama instead of Naru Jahannama.
And what it basically shows here is that the inferior text can in no way cast doubt on the integrity of the Uthmanic recension because the Uthmanic version has its own particular perfect lineage attested by a numerable chain of narrators. There is something in Islam called the Isnad, a chain of transmitters, and a report is only authenticated based on the authenticity of the chain of narrators. Even if the report seems sound, if the chain of narrators is questionable, that particular report is entirely rejected. There is an entire science on this particular issue which doesn't detract from what I had initially suggested and said. Um, James basically mentioned the story about um, Ibn Masud and why is it that Ibn Masud didn't give his text up? Well, if I have a personal copy of the Bible and I have my own footnotes and I have my own uh, marginal notes and annotations, would I want to give up my personal text? Is there anything that you have seen, James, where Ibn Mas'ud questioned that the Uthmanic recension was not authentic? Is there anything that you have in the scholarly tradition? Do we have a manuscript of Ibn Mas'ud um, or a source which seems to suggest that the writings or the Quran which was possessed by Ibn Mas'ud was significantly different? Do you have any manuscripts? Nothing at all. Absolutely nothing. So all he can do is rely on speculation to prove his particular point. I never relied on speculation. I gave you actual variants and explained it to you. All he could do was present rearrangement of the surahs, perhaps an underlying text in the palimpsest, but nothing that detracts from the point that the overall skeletal text of the Quran remains the same in terms of message and in terms of authenticity. Thank you. I am uh, deeply disappointed in Yusuf's response, personally. Uh, I am so because when you stand up in front of a crowd and say, James didn't rebut this, James didn't rebut that, before the guy has his rebuttal time, that's not how you do debates. I'm supposed to do a presentation, a positive presentation. I'm not supposed to be responding to what he said in my opening statement. This is my time to do that. So about five minutes of that was, was just a cheap debating trick, and I, and I don't think we should do that. That's not honoring to the, the process and honoring to the audience in any way, shape, or form. Uh, number two, he said, I'm, I'm dependent upon secondary material. Yeah, those pictures of uh, 328A are very secondary, aren't they? That's as primary as you can get. You can't get any more primary than that. It's Yusuf who does not understand New Testament textual criticism, never looked at any of the data himself, cannot analyze a textual critical text itself. He's the one going on secondary material, not me. I gave you primary. Bukhari is considered to be primary material in Islamic studies, okay? I mean, if he was still up here, Sheikh Yasser Qadi's book is filled with citations of Bukhari and Muslim. I've listened to all of Sheikh Yasser's lectures on Hadith studies. Don't say I'm using only secondary material. He then attacked Al-Kindi. If you remember, I simply used Al-Kindi to demonstrate that the very same traditions found in Bukhari were already known to Christians outside the Islamic community to say, you're depending on a Christian polemicist. Yes, I'm pointing out that for the historian, that source, if it is from 820, as many people have affirmed that it is in historical writings, demonstrates that these issues were known outside of the Islamic community. And in fact, it actually gives better weight to Bukhari, interestingly enough. But instead, we got a polemic response rather than a scholarly response to use of Al-Kindi. No argument that, well, Al-Kindi was wrong. No argument about 328A. No argument about the fact that there's clear editing involved in the, Sa'ana Palimpsest, in the Fogg's Palimpsest manuscript. Just James didn't do this, James didn't do that. That is simply not worthy. By the way, in the email, what I said was there is no argument that what we t possess today in the Quran is a fairly accurate representation of Uthman's text. The question is, is Uthman's text reliable in light of everything I've said this evening? That is my point. A number of times you've heard uh, Yusuf say this, this evening, well, in essence, in principle, we know what the Quranic text was. These variants don't matter. Listen to my debate with Bart Ehrman. 
fundamentally what he says, in essence, in principle, we know what the New Testament was too. In fact, from his perspective, we're just playing around with the original text right now. We can't go any farther than back. And when you look at the text that Bart Ehrman likes to raise, there are things like, well, um, uh, in, in uh, Hebrews 2.9, does it, does it say that Jesus died chorus theu or charis theu? One letter difference, as if that somehow changes the entire meaning of the book of Hebrews, which it does not. So take a look at the information yourself. When he's saying, well, in essence, in principle, in other words, when there's a textual variant in the Quran, it doesn't really matter. When there's a textual variant in the Bible, it does, even if we know what the original was. 1 John 5, 7, I cannot believe that my Muslim friends keep bringing this up. It doesn't appear in the Greek manuscript tradition until the 14th century. Why keep bringing it up? The doctrine of the Trinity is not dependent upon it in any way, shape, or form. Where did Athanasius defend the doctrine of the Trinity on the basis of the Kami Yohanim? See, these are the questions we would ask if we were focused in our subject this evening. Unfortunately, we are not really focused in our subject. I was very concerned that Yusuf said, well, I don't know how much study James has done on the uh, scholarly material of the Quran. I sent Yusuf a number of my books, including what every Christian uses about the Quran, and he would find the very source he cited in the footnotes of the book, including citations on the specific Sa'ana manuscripts that we were discussing that I presented to you. Evidently, they didn't get read. And so this evening, I bring us back to the key issue. The key issue is not how much information is out there, I think that's important. And I think that Christians, all of us Christians, we need to know more about where our Bible came from. You need to know about the longer ending of Mark. You need to know about Mark 16, 9 through 20. That's the longer ending. You need to know about the pericope adultery, John 7, 53 through 8, 11. You need to know about 1 John 5, 7. And the reason it's in the Afrikaans Bible that was in his hotel room is because that was translated from the Textus Receptus, which Yusuf uh, erroneously uh, identified, and I think it was just because he was in a hurry. When the picture came up, he said that was Beza. It's actually Erasmus. But that was based upon the five editions of Erasmus between 1516 and 1535, and then you have the 1550 Stephanus text and the 1598 Beza, and those are the seven printed editions that the King James translators used, and they then were collated together into what's called the Textus Receptus, and Erasmus inserted the Kama Yohannim into the third edition of his text because Codex Montfortianus was written to force him to insert that into 1 John 5.7. I've examined Codex Montfortianus at Trinity College in Dublin. And so the history of this is well known. There's no question about what the original of 1 John was. We have so many manuscripts of 1 John that these are not issues. And the doctrine of the Trinity is in no way, shape, or form based upon the citation of that text, even if there are Christians who might be confused about the subject. The original reading of the New Testament is not determined by what people in the 21st century think about it. It was written long before we came along. Long before we came along. The truth of it existed long before we came along. And so the issue, once again, is this, folks. We have all this information. We're wide open about it, about the New Testament. But the study of the Quranic manuscripts is in its infancy. There is no critical text. I asked, uh, I asked Yusuf to substantiate his 450,000 uh, manuscript thing. Ignored it. Didn't even, didn't even mention it. Didn't even come back to it. Now, maybe he just didn't have time to. Okay, fine. But the point is, there is no list of these manuscripts. There is no way of knowing what they read. And I again come back to the Muslim. I know the basis upon which I read the New Testament. And let me give you an example. Let me give you, let me give you one example in closing this evening that should really illustrate why this is important. Every single historical source in the first hundred years after the crucifixion of Jesus confirms the fact that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Everything, Christian and non-Christian. Every New Testament writer, every secular writer that happened to make mention of it, all said Jesus died under Pontius Pilate. Almost, well, approximately 600 years later, one man, 700 miles away, speaking a different language, who did not know anything about the Old and New Testament, wrote 40 Arabic words that said that Jesus did not die upon a cross. Or at least that's how most people interpreted those words. They're actually not very clear as to what they actually say. Those 40 Arabic words are Surah 4, 157. And as a result, Muslims around the world do not believe that Jesus died upon Calvary's tree, and hence they do not believe in the resurrection. 
Now, what's interesting to me is what we read from Bukhari, from a Muslim source. It records for us that there were entire verses that now stand in the Quran because they were found in the memory of one man, and yet there were people who died at the Battle of Yamama who were memorizers of the Quran. What if they were a person who had only one in their mind, too? And what if someone misremembered this, and it was in the mind of one man? That's the problem with memory. I've got 147 on my clock. And so um, I need my 10 minutes, especially since someone else took more than 10 minutes. So here's the point, folks. Here's the point. One verse that denies the entire historical reality of the crucifixion, that puts the Quran against all of history. Where did it come from? There is not a single commentary on the meaning of Surah 4, 157 in all of the Hadith. No Muslim for 200 years could remember anything that Muhammad said about that surah, about that ayah. This is why you need a documentary history. This is why you need the free translation of the text. This is why you don't want people taking the other manuscripts and soaking them in vinegar and burning them. Because once you do that, you have to trust that that one person that makes the revision got it right. That's the fundamental difference between how these two texts have come to us. And if I've been able to help you to see why it is having many manuscripts that come from many places and hence have textual variants, but in essence and in principle say all the same thing without any question, if I've helped you to be able to see how that is much better, it gives us much more certainty of the original than a controlled transmission of the text, then I've been successful this evening. As I said, if we want to talk about these other issues, we want to talk about John 1-1, I'm ready to go. But the subject this evening was the transmission of the text of the New Testament and the transmission of the text of the Quran. And I hope at least you understand better those issues after being here this evening. Thank you very much. It's the last, um, it's the last closing point from my, and I've just got five minutes. My watch is 25 to... I know, Professor, you've been quite fair and accurate about time. Thank you for that, James. James, I, I wasn't getting personal with you, and I think it's important because I sense that he seems to be offended, but I wasn't using a cheap debating trick in terms of pointing out. I had spoken first on the Quran. I expected him to have engaged some of what I had suggested as he had spoken second. Um, it was not a cheap debating trick. He said I had not referred to the fact of the existence of 450,000 Quranic manuscripts or a quarter of a million. Well, I was actually referring to the source by M. M. Al Azami, the history of the Quranic text from revelation to compilation, a comparative study with the Old and New Testaments. And this is quoted by Sami Amiri in the book Hunting for the Word of God, the quest for the original text of the New Testament and the Quran in the light of textual criticism. So that's a particular source which I was referring to. And in fact, I had read your book. I would have been a fool not to read his book on the Quran and come to a debate with my eyes totally closed. Let me review some of the issues for tonight. Number one, there are ten astounding facts that we cannot deny. It was recited by Muhammad as the overwhelming majority of non-Muslim scholars believe. James may not believe it. The majority of non-Muslim scholars accept it. New Testament, a majority of academic scholars admit that most of the New Testament book were written by unknown authors. James may disagree with this, but the majority of academic scholars, some are liberal, accept this. It was memorized and transmitted orally from inception to today. New Testament, no oral preservation of the text exists. Number three, we have manuscripts from the first century of the Hijra that cover the text. Number four, three, New Testament, no manuscripts from the first century exist. Quran, number four, Muslims from the first century after the text was revealed, read the whole text periodically as commanded by the Prophet and listen to its recitation every year during Ramadan. Children were taught to recite it. We have no idea about the attitude of early Christians towards the NT in the first century, and there is evidence that canonization of what constituted the New Testament book took place only in the fourth century. Number five, the official copy was agreed upon and established in the era of the companions of the prophet. The gospels were written by unknown authors. No historical evidence that the disciples knew these books. The official copies of the Greek New Testament are still being decided today. Number six, the official copy was approved by thousands of companions. You see, James keeps on mentioning about Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Has he come and brought us a source to suggest 
that even though Ibn Mas'ud kept his copy with him, that he challenged the Quranic text that was there, and that he said that it's false, it's inaccurate. We don't have any records about that. Number six, there is no official copy of the New Testament, not even today. Number seven, could I move on? Um, don't know. The sectarian schism in the first centuries did not result in the emergence of a different Quran. You see, James made the point that if there was a division, as there de indeed was during the time of the Caliphate, between the Shiites and the Sunnis, the Shiites that came out, then today if you were to go to Iran, where they have a different theology, they would have had a different Quran. But why is it that the Shiites in the Muslim world today still follow the same Quran that is in existence in the Sunni world? That would be an ideal situation, that the Shiites would have developed a separate Quran to justify their theology. Yet the Quran that you see in Tehran and Isfahan is essentially the same to the Quran that you've got in the Sunni world. Sectarian schism was the main reason for the creation of a huge number of books which claim that they are the words of God to which the new sects attribute a divine source. Point number eight, Muslims have the original book in its original language. Point number eight, Jesus spoke Aramaic. Or maybe Hebrew, but the New Testament books were in Greek. So even if I were to say tonight, yes, James, you, can, you have the original New Testament, then what? Do you have the original words of Jesus? No, you don't. Number nine, we have even the minutest and intricate details of the history of the Quran. Number nine, the first hundred years after the writing of the autographs is an obscure zone. You see, that whole development period about the text of the Quran is there and preserved in the classical sources. You have nothing like that in the New Testament. And the last point, number 10, there does not exist any dogmatic issue be behind the variants as reported by the companions. Dogma was behind putting part of the oral tradition into written form and also emergence of what were later called canonical and non-canonical writings. Can you see that? That in all the discussions, in James, and I respect him, and I respect his scholarship, and I respect his humility and his humor indeed, he couldn't show us a single variant on dogma. And that was the difference between his presentation and mine. That even though he conceded to the point that there were passages in the New Testament which substantiated dogma and which many people still believe today, those passages are indeed a fabrication. We have nothing like that in the Quran. We don't have a Quran which says Muhammad is not the prophet of God or Muhammad was not the last prophet of God. And so in the final conclusion, these are ten major reasons in terms of why the Quranic text as it stands today in the 21st century is fundamentally more reliable than the text of the New Testament. Thank you. <laughs>
Of course it was. So I have presented this information to you. We have given the information this evening, and I had pretty much summarized uh, what I needed to say, but since I have two minutes and 53 seconds, and since Yusuf specifically asked me to do it later on, I'm going to do it. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. NRK ain halagos. In the beginning, the verb that is used here is ain. It is an imperfect verb. It's not the aorist verb that would uh, point to a point in origin. John 1.1a 1, 1 is saying that the Logos has eternally existed. The Logos is eternal. The Logos did not come into existence at a point in time. Kaihalagos ain prostantheon. The Logos was in the presence of the Father. Prostantheon, intimate communion with the Father. The only thing he referred to is the issue of the third clause, kaitheos ain halagos. And he quoted from one scholarly source. If you look at the scholarship on this subject today, you will discover that there's been an explosion of discussion concerning the anarthrous predicate nominative. Uh, that is, in that last phrase, theos comes before the verb, and it doesn't have an article. Now, if it had an article, it would teach heresy. Because if it said, kai ha theos ain ha logos, it would mean all that God is, the logos is, and all that the logos is, God is, and that would teach modalism. That would teach an error that we would reject. Instead, by placing theos in front of the verb, the description is being made of the nature of the theos. That's what Harner was talking about in what uh, Yusuf uh, uh, was, uh, was reading. And so what you have in John 1.1 1, 1 is John 1.1a 1, 1 says, the word is eternal. John 1.1b 1, 1 says, the word was eternally in communion with theos, theon in the accusative, of course, and that's going to be identified who that was in verse 18. We'll look at that in a moment. And the third clause says, the word is as to his nature, deity, theos. That's what John 1.1 1, 1 tells us. And you see, John 1.1 1, 1 is a part of the prologue of John. John 1.18 is called the bookends. It's the other end of that. And what it says is, no one has seen God at any time. The monogenes theos, the unique God, he has exegeted him. He has made him known. The unique God who is in the bosom of the Father. He's at the Father's side. There's intimate communion. That's why we can know who God is, is because Jesus can reveal him fully and completely. A mere prophet cannot reveal the eternal God fully and completely, but the God-man can. That's the testimony of the prologue of John. That's the testimony in the original language as well. And by the way, there really isn't any question about what John 1, 1 said. If there were so many people that didn't agree with that, the original disciples of Jesus from the Islamic perspective, why is the manuscript tradition unanimous in its readings of John 1, 1 at that place? That's a question we want to think about. Thank you for letting me have the few moments to respond to that. Yusuf did ask me to do that later on, so I snuck it in. Thank you very much for your indulgence. Thank you for your perseverance and your calmness. And thank you very much for our speakers. I think we had a lively debate. Thank you. I forgot something. I apologize. I always try to do this. I think it's a good thing to do. I have a book for Yusuf. It's called The Old Testament Can, The New Testament Church. It's, a, it's one of the best books for anybody who wants to know about the can of the Old Testament. I was going to give it to him that last five minutes. I forgot. I would like to give it to him now if I could, please. A gift from the one speaker to the other one. And uh, on your way out, you can, uh, I think there might be a few copies left of this book of James, uh, Dr. James White. Uh, it's published this year, so it's very, very recent. And I won't read what so many people say here promoting this book. Um, what every Christian needs to know about the Quran. There's another one of his, um, Pulpit Crimes, The Criminal Mishandling of God's Word. That sounds very interesting. Have a good night's rest. <laughs>